Chicago. Look, my name is David Mears. I am the director of the environmental law programs here at Vermont Law School. Welcome. Welcome on this beautiful day. The fact that that this many people would choose to spend um, one of those rare, precious, um, beautiful, sunny, green days in Vermont inside uh, speaks to your commitment and dedication to the issue that we're going to tackle today. Um, so I, I, let me let me just share some some logistics and some thanks and uh, just a mix of things so we can jump quickly into the program. I just want to note at the outside, uh, the, the main group of people I want to thank is you. Uh, as I look around this room, what an incredible gathering. Just an unbelievable mix of, of perspectives, background, experiences. Um, there's centuries of experience and knowledge in environmental land use, um, housing, transportation, um, government, development, uh, advocacy, just what an incredible gathering of folks. Uh, I think one of our, our grandest hopes, where's Kate? Kate's probably out there chatting, so. Um, you know, one of our grandest hopes as for the folks in Peg, uh, Peg Elmer, the folks that kind of conceived of this was that by bringing this group together, we would um, be able to catalyze the energy, the ideas, and begin to move forward um, collectively as a state in the conversation that's being led by our legislature, thanks to Amy Sheldon, um, for Middlebury, who's the chair of the General Assembly Committee that's been charged with kind of getting public input and, and uh, figuring out where, where is Act 250 going to go. Um, but gosh, there's too many people for me to even begin to thank. Uh, Diane Snelling, the chair of the Natural Resources Board. Julie Moore from Natural Resources. Uh, just what an amazing gathering of folks. So thank, thank you for, for coming. Um, some more specific things. I want to thank um, Kate McCarthy and Peg Elmer in particular for their, their tremendous work to pull all of this together, to organize the panels, the speakers, the invitations. Um, thanks to BT Digger um, and to Teresa Murray Clausen, um, who have helped promote and advertise and who will be providing um, coverage and uh, 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 information about this out to the public as this goes forward. Um, thanks to the Vermont Planners Association, thanks to the Vermont Natural Resources Council, um, to the High Meadows Fund, to Two Rivers out of Quichi, and to the Vermont Association of, of um, Planning and Development, the VAPTA. I never have to say it out loud, so Vermont Association of Planners and Developers, Development Agencies, there we go. I knew, not developers, sorry. We've never confused original planning commissions with developers. Um, so thank you to all of you who, who pulled together to, to pull this off. Um, I also wanted to note a couple of logistics. One, the bathroom situation here is a little odd. Um, and I don't mean the, the composting toilets thing. I mean just that for a group this, this large, um, at breaks, um, giving coffee and tea and all of that, there would be more of you than could fit in the, the little bathrooms just up the hallway. So there are also bathrooms on the second and third floor of that, the Debevoise building. There's also bathrooms around the corner. You go across through this door out into our little um, cafe and around the corner there's some bathrooms there. There's some bathrooms in the library. Um, and there's some bathrooms all the way down the hall into the Oaks classroom building. So uh, I suspect just given the mass of people, you may have to use all of those um, options. Um, another logistical thing, we have, a, we, we now operate year-round as a law school. We have an entering group of uh, uh, law students, uh, about 25 or so, who are on campus today and will be participating in a whole series of orientation meetings that will be in meeting rooms scattered about. And there's some breakout sessions this afternoon. And if you find yourself in a room where you're being informed about um, how to prepare for a case or learning about the Socratic method, um, of instruction, you're probably not in the right room. So just a heads up around that. Um, oh, and then continuing legal education credits. For those of you who are impaired by a Juris Doctor degree and are looking for um, continuing legal education credits, there's a sign-up sheet out in, in the um, foyer here. And make sure that you fill out the uh, evaluation form and you can get a certificate of participation. So with that, 
Um, let me turn things over to um, Amy Sheldon, who will, will kick things off and kind of get us oriented, and um, I'll follow on with a little more discussion about the challenges we're facing. But again, thank, welcome, and thank you so much. Thank you, David. Um, wow, well, thank you all for being here. Like, I gotta say, last week when set, we thought the session was over and we thought we were gonna get into our Act 250 work, there was a moment when I felt really alone. And um, that's just, uh, you've disabused me of that completely. It's great to see you all here. It's my absolute pleasure to be with you. Um, what I'm gonna just briefly cover is the legislative process that we're in. Um, and then I get to talk first and step back and listen and learn from all of you today. So thanks again. Um, for taking the time to participate. It does mean a lot to us. Just a little bit about me um, and my interest in land use planning. I am a natural resource planner professionally, uh, but my first job was at the Middlebury Land Trust and um, Art Gibb was actually on our board. So um, he was the chair of the first Act 250 Commission and certainly piqued my interest in serving in the legislature. And I thought one day I'll do that. Um, I didn't know that the stars would align for me to actually get to follow in his footsteps. And I know we all love where we live in Vermont, but I would make the case that Addison County can be a really good sampler of all of the issues facing Vermont. And so I'm, I'm proud to share it and, and put my time and effort into it. Um, Act 47 is the, is the law that we're operating under and it created a commission on Act 250 the next 50 years. Um, we have six legislators who are the commission, but we also have a crackerjack crew of advisors, 14 people five of whom are from the administration or their appointees from the agencies who work most closely with Act 250. And um, then um, the remainder is from sort of all over the spectrum of interested parties, from the development community to the planning um, agencies and everybody in between. I don't have to lean over so much. Um, so our process began in September and it's about a year and a half process. We started by hearing from our advisors in public hearings in the State House, one a month, September, October, November, December. And um, then, of course, we started the session. And during the session, we had um, began, we, we did some subcommittee work. Um, one of the great things is that, in some ways, we don't have enough time to get our hands around all the issues. But there are so many people excited and interested. The, the biggest challenge is going to be how to get the public input and the input from professionals who use Act 250 from all the various ways and angles we do it. And not just Act 250, but land use planning in general, um, and, and compile that into a meaningful report. So the three phases of our process, the um, background information that's over, that ended in December, we're just beginning the public output phase, and that starts on June 27th. We'll have our first public hearing. There'll be six public meetings around the state. Um, but in addition to that, we're going to have online surveys and hard copy surveys available. And most importantly to many of you is that we're going to ask you to take, we're going to have a meeting in a box and have you facilitate additional meetings so that we can get to as many Vermonters as possible. And the purpose of those public meetings really is to get, get high-level input from Vermonters themselves on the issues that they see confronting us. We, we will frame those questions for them and, and get their input, but see if there's anything that we're, we've missed, first of all. Um, educate people on what is land use planning, what is Act 250, and what isn't Act 250. There's a lot of people who get confused. Um, um, and more importantly, though, kind of touch in with the public and see what is the appetite for more environmental protection um, and how do they see their communities growing and evolving and staying um, vibrant in the future. And, and is there a role for land use planning and um, regulation in that what is, and what is their appetite for that? So we'll have many ways, many avenues for the public to engage. And then um, we will move into in September, we move into um, our report writing phase, and then we'll, we'll it, the legislation is a little bit open-ended. Um, it allows us to recommend changes or not recommend changes. Um, actually, one thing, one little point that you are probably all at least individually aware of, but you may not know the cumulative factoid around this, which I find interesting, is that Act 250 is actually the most amended section of statute, at least that's that's the sort of buzz around the State House building. It's been amended just about every biennium um, since its inception. 
Um, and if I skipped over this too quickly, it turns 50 in 2018, or 2020, excuse me. And so, you know, it's a really great time to look at what was a, a landmark environmental legislation. It was only ever partially implemented, and so the conversations around um, how do we, do we or do we not um, engage in a more broad scale statewide planning, um, and what are the things we need to talk about. The subject areas in our statute are very similar to the breakout sessions that will be happening today, looking at fragmentation and settlement patterns, climate change and can we integrate more um, consideration for impacts of climate change into our land use regulation and, and planning, um, water quality, uh, appeals and structure, just sort of, we're not sure how much that will take to the public, but I very much appreciate the fact that professional organizations are taking the lead in this kind of conversation. The hope for the public meetings is that they remain very high level and visionary. Um, and that we provide avenues for people to give us the feedback on specific changes that need to happen, um, but that the public meetings really focus on, on the higher level conversation of where do we see the state going and what is the role of Act 250 in the future. Um, then the final sections that we dive into more deeply are jurisdiction and exemptions. And I do believe they do parallel the breakouts this afternoon. So, it's the intention of, of the sponsors of this conference today, as well as my own commission, to take your input. We're going to get a report summarizing what happens today, and um, I promise you that we'll read it and integrate it into our work into the future. So thank you again for coming out, spending the time, and for all of your care and concern for the Vermont landscape. Thank you, Amy. Well, I've, I've been given the task of trying to identify some of the, the challenges facing us as we embark in this effort, um, which I think in, in, in many ways, Amy, uh, Representative Sheldon has just summarized pretty effectively. But I'd, I'd like to give a little kind of more colorful perspective on it. And I'll, I'll note that I am not an expert on Act 250. I don't consider myself to be. I've, I have certainly practiced law in the area, and I've certainly um, interacted with the statute over the years, but I, I feel far from an expert, and I'm trying to, in fact, through my remarks, reflect back some of the commentary I've heard um, over, over a period of years, frankly. Um, and I'll also note that Vermont Law School has, has had a tradition of being engaged in this work that goes back quite a ways, um, all the way to Dick Brooks, uh, Professor Emeritus here at Vermont Law School, and if, if you haven't had the chance to glance through his paper, uh, we've made available a, a a link to his paper online. It's still it's a work in progress, so it's not quite fully polished. Um, thanks to some of you for offering you know some editorial remarks to help him clean it up. But nonetheless, the content of it reflects some really a long-term deep thinking that Professor Brooks has provided after really a career of looking at Act 250. And so it's worth looking at his perspectives on on where the law has been and where he thinks it, it ought to go. Um, there were also, I'll note, you know, there's one of the, the, the long-term challenges from the very inception of Act 250, um, but all the way through its life, has been the idea of state planning. Um, it was, you know, initially a law that had a very substantial component of state planning that was stripped out early in the early days, and then uh, attempted to be added back. Doug Costell, a former dean at the law school, participating in the, in the Act 200 Commission that you know, presented a whole set of ways to begin to get communities in the state of Vermont to be part of a state planning effort. And that too has been as a result of the multitude of amendments, um, largely been um, removed from the statute. So it remains um, largely a permitting statute. Um, and so I think that, I'll just leave with that as a theme. I, I think that's a fundamental challenge for us as we look at the statute, is the, the degree to which it has simply become a permit by permit ad hoc decision making tool. It's not that it's completely divorced from municipal planning or regional planning, but the linkages are not strong. And it's also, uh, we have a plethora of other plants in the state. We have, uh, just within the Agency of Natural Resources, there's a variety of plans, river planning, um, you know, uh, uh, watershed planning. There's all sorts of plans, and then of course transportation has, has plans, as does we have plans around housing. 
and other attributes of, uh, that all touch on how we develop on the landscape at the state level. It's, it's not true that we don't have state planning. Uh, it is true that those plans aren't effectively coordinated. Um, it's also true that those plans don't necessarily link up um, and align with the regional plans. Uh, and it also is true that the municipal planning, um, to the extent that it happens, um, lines up with the regional plan. So there's, there's a, a degree to which planning and the, inter and the intersection with Act 250 remains a fundamental challenge. It goes back to the very beginning days. Um, and you'll, you'll hear from some other speakers today who will kind of share experiences from other states uh, on, on how they've begun to try to challenge, you know, deal with that challenge in their own states. This is not unique to Vermont. Um, one, one speaker last night who you'll hear from suggested maybe we should just not call it planning. <laughs> maybe the problem is we need a different word. But I'll let, I'll let her um, expound on that idea. But anyway, so I, I see that as a central challenge, is thinking about how do we, if we're going to modify and amend Act 250 into the future, how do we tackle this issue? It's been highly controversial, it's been elusive, um, yet it remains central to um, answering the question of what is this landscape going to look like? But in some ways, maybe I've leaped over maybe the biggest challenge that we should start with, which I know is the, the legislative um, commission is going to be trying to understand and get perspective on from the public, which is, do we have a shared vision of what the landscape in Vermont should look like? Um, and then second, is Act 250 the vehicle that we want to use to try to protect and preserve whatever that shared vision is? So I think there are some very high level discussions that we need to have, but my sense is based on substantial work over the years that's been done um, including work by the Vermont Council on Rural Development, that there's a fairly strong alignment across ideological perspectives and what we want the landscape to look like. Where it breaks down is, is the role of Act 250 in protecting that and then the balancing between protecting um, private interests and, uh, and the broader public interests that we, we always need to figure out how to balance in these conversations. So with that, with those very large kind of high level um, challenges that we face, some of the, the more specific and in our face challenges are just simply the fact that the, the world has changed since 1970 when the, the act was first enacted. Substantial changes and it continues to change and we can see on the horizon some even, even larger changes. Um, one, there's been a, a very pragmatic level here at the law school. We spent a lot of time talking about all the variety of environmental laws that have passed, many of which passed in the 70s and 80s um, and have continued in, in through, uh, they stopped at the federal level, but they've continued, at least in Vermont, we've continued to add and adapt environmental laws over the period of time since the law was first enacted. So Act 250 is no longer a central law in terms of the variety of air pollution, water pollution, uh, waste management. Um, that it was, may have been intended to address in its early days. And so there's a ch significant challenge to think about how do we, in, how do we uh, intersect those two permitting regimes. That's complicated, wickedly complicated work to do. And the act and the current systems, I don't think are sufficiently um, interactive. Uh, we, we are not, we have very uh, um, inefficient and confusing processes for applicants, for advocates, and for the broader public to try to figure out how these permitting systems and regulatory programs fit together. Another major challenge has been technology. Technology has changed dramatically in lots of different ways, and we see bigger changes on the horizon. Whether we're talking about energy systems, solar, uh, wind, other renewables, um, the wind battles alone you know, have changed the, the landscape and the way and the relationships among um, all of us who are engaged in thinking about uh, the Vermont landscape. Solar energy having similar impacts. And the relationship between the uh, work of the Public Utility Commission and their work in approving um, uh, energy projects and what happens on land use. Also not, not really baked. We don't really have a good, comfortable, streamlined system for managing the very important choices that we're making about what the landscape looks like in light of the changes in energy technology. So if we are committed as a state to, um, you know, what is it, 90% by 2050 of renewable energy as part of our energy portfolio, what does that mean for our landscape and is there a role for Act 250? Um, should there be a role for Act 250 in that? Or is it just, we're gonna ignore that, pretend that there is no man behind the curtain. Um, transportation, transportation technology. What's, you know, what's happening there in terms of an electrified transportation fleet? 
Um, what does it mean if in fact we begin over the next uh, coming decade to have cars that are self you know, guiding? What's, what's happening with transportation? That also relates to a set of changes that are happening that are not entirely uh, uh, technology based but also a cultural element. What's, as, as, as the, the generations of Vermonters are growing up and wanting to live um, in small downtowns and cities and uh, you know, more, uh, you know, in, you know not, not out in the suburban sprawl, if that pressure changes, what does that mean? Because we also know we have a, a, a strong, a, a major problem in terms of affordable housing in our communities. So the, the intersection between energy, transportation, other infrastructure like communications infrastructure and housing and the landscape, right? These are all su substantial changes that have been happening and will continue to happen. Um, is Act 250 in its current frame, you know, up to the task of adapting to that? Similarly, we have, you know, one of the central pieces of our economy, um, our agricultural economy, our forest economy, our working lands economy, major changes happening there. The dairy industry is under a, a major pressure right now and has been for a period of years, the consolidation of dairies, the, the water quality challenges, just the, the existential challenges facing the dairy sector, um, and a proliferation and hopefully you know, growth in the diversity and different kinds of farming um, as, as it evolves in the state. These are, these are major changes, pressures. What role for Act 250? You know, for value added um, processing of our food products and forest products, how, does that, how do we fit that into um, protecting the landscape as whatever vision we have for that. Similarly, for the forest economy, major disruptions have happened um, over the past decade with, with substantial changes and the, and the way in which land ownership and the demographic changes in the state, the, the, the way in which uh, land is being held in increasingly smaller and smaller blocks. The things that we have assumed um, would be the case um, are no longer going to be the case going into the future. And we can either wait until it gets to a crisis moment, or perhaps we can use this moment in time to think about what would we like, how would we like to deal with those challenges, and is Act 250 a vehicle that we could use to do that? And then uh, finally, I'll just mention one of my own personal interests in a, a pet area that I think is, is substantial but um, important, uh, um, even though it's you know, just one of many issues, but is the issue of a polluted stormwater runoff in the state, an area that I've, I've worked on extensively when I was with the Department of Environmental Conservation and the work that continues on. That, that, that is not just a pollution issue, that's about how do we live on the landscape issue. You know, as we begin to look at what are the challenges facing our lakes and ponds and streams and rivers, it turns out not to be just finding a few polluters, it's, that it's all of us, it's all the activities on the landscape. And it's the way in which we manage and live in accordance or in association with our river systems. So in a time as we head into what is probably the biggest and most substantial change that we face of all, which are the impacts of climate change and the, the, the dramatic increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, what does that mean for our landscape? What does it mean for our rivers? What does it mean for um, our forests? What does it mean for our wetlands and floodplains? And I say all of those things because it's not it's not all negative and it's all not all bad news. We have in Vermont a landscape that has the attributes of a state that could be resilient and can also uh, play a major role in moving to a, you know, a carbon, at least a carbon neutral kind of future. We have all the attributes that we can figure out how to use our forests, use our healthy soils, figure out how this concept of, of working in um, community centers, towns and village centers, um, with a working landscape around us, how that in its own way um, is a major contribution to living in a, you know, a carbon um, free uh, uh, kind of future. We have, we have all the tools and um, attributes that we need before us. Can we step up and use this moment and look at Act 250 as a focal point? It may be putting too much on Act 250 to say it's gonna solve all of those multitude of problems. But at its best, Act 250 has been a place that brings community groups together with state officials to figure out how we want the landscape to work. So that's the, I'll conclude there by just saying I think that's my greatest and highest hope is that this process will fully engage the broader Vermont public and that we will come out of this conversation enriched with a, a recommitment to a shared set of values. 
So with that, um, I will turn it over to the next person. The next two. The next two people, yes, thank you. I, I think these folks need no introduction, but uh, <laughs> I, I think you all know um, the, our Natural Resources Board Chair, Diane Snelling, um, longtime um, supporter of Act 250 and a, and a major player in the state, so thank you. Thank you. And Rob Wilmington of, tell me your firm's name, <laughs> who is going to have his remarks. Um, I was asked to talk about the history and heroics of Act 250. And it ha it, so I've taken sort of a personal view towards that. So bear with me. I know there are people in the audience who um, can correct me if I've stated the wrong names or the wrong years. But good morning and welcome. I thank you to the Vermont Planners Association, especially PEG and the steering committee, the Vermont Law School, VNRC, VT Digger, and Representative Amy Sheldon, chair of the Act 47 Legislative Commission on Act 250 the next 50 years. I don't know if there are any other members of the commission, but I welcome them. Um, perhaps Representative Dean was here. No? OK. Um, I've enjoyed the research in preparation for these remarks and strongly recommend that interested people will read some of the published histories of Act 250, including Professor Richard Brooks' treatise and his recent essays, Paul Gillis uh, for many articles, but especially Act 250 from birth to middle age, Greening Vermont by Elizabeth Courtney and Eric Zensi, and The Story of Vermont by Christopher Kleiza and Stephen Trombulak. We recently, the Natural Resources Board recently moved our offices from the Dewey Building at the National Life Campus to number 10 Baldwin Street. And let's see. Uh, and then we had been in that building for quite a while. So of course we found some really interesting artifacts along the way. Um, one of the best examples is a very large binder uh, labeled Art Gibbs Historical Novel About Vermont's Environment. Act 250 history from 1966 to present day, which although not truly a novel, <laughs> does contain the best kind of information that is familiar to most legislators, drafts, reports, correspondence, except there are very few notes, and I intend to keep researching to see what I can find. The binder also had the passage of Act 250, 1960 to 1970, written in 1992 by Christopher Bailey for the History Honors Program at Dartmouth College. And I found that very helpful. It was a very, it's a very step-by-step um, -step kind of description of the legislative process. I also watched the wonderful Vermont public television series, The Governors, with Chris Graff interviewing Dean Davis. To start at the beginning, I'm not a native Vermonter, but I am very local, and I've been around for a long time. I'm actually old enough to remember um, the passage of Act 250, and I know there are a few other old coots in the audience, so <laughs> bear with us as we talk about the past. In 1970, I was 18, a senior at CVU High School, and full of fire about re equality and um, honoring the earth. Before that, however, I remember the building of Interstate 89. It was a very exciting time, and it seemed that there was massive earth moving everywhere. We went on frequent family excursions to view the progress from the first boulder, bulldozers to placing the signs. The building of the interstate provided something new and exciting every day. It literally reshaped Vermont. When I see the aerial photos of the half-finished cloverleaf in South Burlington or the original Cupola Hotel, it's difficult not to time travel a bit. I recently became aware of the UVM Landscape Change Program and their amazing collection of digital images of Vermont. I've spent hours visiting the past, and I would recommend it's well worth looking up. Uh, you can just go to the UVM Landscape Change Program and easily search and find hundreds of really wonderful photos of Vermont history. And that's the majority of what you're seeing here. <laughs> um, one of the first images I found was the bulldozers breaking ground in a field near South Burlington. It produced an instant memory of the intense curiosity I felt watching it happen. 
It's well known that the interstate brought um, big changes to Vermont and many more people could, could visit and stay in this beautiful state. New types of commerce emerged and outside perspectives met up with rural ways. I-89 was and is an incredible feat of design and engineering. I tried but failed to find the names of the designers. But even with today's traffic, uh, it's still a wonderful road to drive on. It's a pleasure. When we imagine transportation for the next 50 years, I hope it will be as beautiful as 89. Even without the changes of the interstate, 1960 to 1970 was a dramatic decade. In 1962, Phil Hoff was elected in Vermont as the first Democratic governor in over 100 years, and President Kennedy was assassinated. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act passed, and the Beatles played at Shea Stadium. There were riots in Selma in 1965 and in Detroit in 1967. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in March of 1968, and then Robert Kennedy in June. It was a time of great uh, change and turbulence and a growing awareness of the need to engage to be part of making the world a better place. Human impacts on the environment were part of the discussion. Uh, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, had been published in 1962 and continued to gain momentum. In Vermont, there was a lot of optimism because of Hoff's election. He was a bold thinker and understood the times. He was reelected in 1964 and in 1966. In 1965, the average median income in Vermont was $6,900, and the population was about 390,000 people. When I read that, it was a um, very shocking way to remember how much has changed in terms of the economy also. A piece of personal history, in 1966, my father ran against Governor Hoff in his campaign for a third term. Of course, my father lost. He knew he wouldn't win, but he ran anyway to give the people a choice. Sincerely, it was hard at the time, but it also led to, I hope, great personal growth. The knowledge that it was possible for a candidate of good qualifications and ideas and uh, could, could run and still lose is an excellent preparation for the realities of politics. Dean Davis ran for governor and was elected in November of 1968, defeating Jack Daly, the lieutenant governor and a former mayor of Rutland. In the same election, George Aiken was reelected to the US Senate. Davis had been considered the underdog. He had never run for election and wasn't well known, although he had served as president of the National Life Company for many years. On the Vermont Public Television governor's uh, program, Governor Davis responds to Chris Graff's question, what made the difference in this election? By saying he and his wife went to every town in Vermont twice and some places much more often. He also talks about visiting, quote, centers of influence, which he further describes as important people that could persuade other people. Uh, Governor Davis was well known for being practical. The interstate had brought rapid second home development in southern Vermont, and because there wasn't any regulation, the houses were built on steep slopes with inadequate septic. Bill Schmidt of the Wyndham County Regional Planning Commission invited the governor to come and see what was happening, and he did. The scene as described was awful, with sewage running down the hill. Bill continued to be an activist and an agitator on behalf of finding a solution and protecting the environment. In June of 1969, Governor Davis issued an executive order creating a commission of environmental control to review the situation and deliver a report back to the legislature in January of 1970. Art Gibb, the representative from Weybridge, was appointed chair of the commission, which is, of course, why it's referred to as the Gibb Commission. Art Gibb was a retired investment banker who moved to Vermont in 1951 to farm. He was first elected to the House in 1962 and served on Ways and Means, and when the chair of House Natural Resources became vacant, he asked to be appointed and was. In 1971, Gibb was elected as a senator from Addison County and served until 1987. 
Even after Hoff's election, the, legislative, uh, the legislature maintained a Republican majority. In 1969, the Speaker, of House, uh, the Speaker of the House was Richard Mallory, who later became Congressman. In 1970, John Burgess became Speaker. He later became a Lieutenant Governor. The Senate pro tem was George Cook in 1969. However, he was appointed by President Nixon to the U.S. Attorney position, and Ed Janeway became pro tem. The members of the commission constituted a diverse range of expertise. I think we have a list, yes. Unfortunately, there were no women on the commission, so I'm particularly gra uh, glad that Amy is chair of this commission. The task must have seemed overwhelming. We wanted strong controls, Mr. Gibbs said in an interview. The question was how to do it, and I would say we're still trying to figure that out. Uh, there was also an advisory committee um, to the commission, which was a very broad, again, another very broad group of people with lots of expertise who participated very um, uh, closely with the, the commission. And there were three women on this uh, advisory committee. The uh, two women are listed as uh, essentially Mrs. Mrs. Harvey Smith. Um, which to me was a, a, another throwback to 1969 saying, really? Like, what are their names? I mean, that's not their name. Um, it, and one woman, because she was not married, was listed as Miss. So, I mean, I just, it just was another part of sort of saying, what was the culture of that time? Um, the commission began working during the summer and fall of 1969, and the chair established special committees to report on the issues of water quality, high altitudes, pesticides, open space, and health. As the facts on the special issues evolved, the, committee wrestled, rest, the commission wrestled with the structure of the necessary controls. Walter Blucher, who was a member of the commission with real planning experience, he drafted an outline which, despite many revisions, remained essentially the same in the final version. In January of 1970, the governor relieved the commission of drafting the report and transferred that responsibility to the attorney general, Jim Jeffords. Jeffords eventually um, enlisted his assistant, John Hansen, to direct the drafting of the report. He was assisted by multiple legislators and citizens, including Jonathan Brownell. The commission report became the basis for H-417, and its process through the legislature encountered many stops and starts. Apparently, there was strong support in the House, especially from many of the legislators who had worked on the passage of the anti-billboard law in 1966. The House Natural Resources Committee and its chair, Mr. Royal Cutts of Townsend, provided strong steady support. There were also many people who were opposed uh, the state ta taking such actions, including Representative Salmon, who later became governor in 1975. Also opposed was Senator Arthur Jones from Essex Orleans, who was chair of the Senate Natural Resources Committee. Jones had worked on the anti-billboard law but thought that state control of development was a government intrusion. After the usual back and forth, 417 passed both chambers and was signed by Governor Davis on April 9, 1970. Act 250 is an elegant, did I skip here? In this, yep. I did, in the same spring? Yeah, in that same spring of 1970, the first Earth Day and the first Green Up Day were celebrated. Governor Davis was re-elected in November 1970, again after being considered as an underdog because he had instituted a sales tax and passed Act 250. The politics of then aren't that different from now. Each of the legislators, commission members, advisors, and citizens who participated in creating Act 250 are heroes. Like all significant legislation, the best policy happens when it's possible to collaborate. The legislators of 1969 and 1970 are the same type of individuals who serve today. They care deeply about Vermont and want to find agreements that create solutions. Our world is full of people who seek fame and celebrity. And when I speak of heroes, I'm referring to the kind of people who don't think of themselves that way. It's their passion for an issue that makes them heroes. 
The entire creation of Act 250 was heroic. It remains a vivid example of people thoughtfully doing what they believed was right. Act 250 is an elegant law, and it deserves to be implemented with the same grace as it was written. Its goals remain relevant, although it does need to adapt to new knowledge and science. As you consider the questions posed by Act 47, remember this is an opportunity to create the next phase of a legacy for Vermont. Please try not to be distracted by the current flaws in the program and have the vision to imagine an ideal situation. We must think first about what we hope will be the Vermont in the future we want. And then we can decide by determining what we want, we can design the right regulation to deliver those outcomes. In your discussions, please also try to keep separate the law from the administration. I know there are many examples of delays and confusion, and from the beginning of my time as chair, I have been committed to developing a high-functioning permit process. The NRB continues to make improvements to our administrative protocols, and although these changes may not yet be apparent to applicants, progress is happening. In December, we are on schedule to launch a completely online application. It's my hope that soon applicants will have the predictability and consistency that they deserve from the permit process. It's also my hope and intention that planning and regulation must start working together to find the alignment that Vermont needs. As planners, you have the unique role in these discussions because it remains critical that the work of municipalities and regional planning organizations be respected and recognized as an essential part of statewide thinking. I'd like to end with a quote from my father from 1983 when he was governor. The statement is from a publication titled Managing Rural Growth, the Vermont Development Review Process. It was produced by the Environmental Board of the State of Vermont. Our challenge is to preserve those things about Vermont for which we love her while building economic opportunity so that it is not necessary to be already wealthy to enjoy this unusual place. To meet that challenge, we must begin with a determination to protect our environment. If we fail there, there will be little point to success in the economic scene because we would have lost that which we wish to be able to afford. If the prize is gone, the struggle loses meaning. The Vermont environment is that prize. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, David, in his opening remarks, talked about what really is the evergreen issue for discussing um, Act 250, which is what is the role of planning and regulatory review? And I'm going to talk a little bit about how that issue played itself out in uh, a series of highly contested uh, regulatory battles in the 1980s involving the Killington Ski Area. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, what Diane called the culture of those times. Um, in the early 80s, Killington was expanding aggressively with ski infrastructure and with residential real estate development. And each condominium phase and each uh, expansion of the uh, of a ski lift was being treated uh, by Killington as the applicant as a freestanding project unrelated to anything else they were doing. Uh, in the real estate uh, development, there were often different entities developing it, but they were all part of the same resort. They were all sharing common infrastructure and highways and sewage. Uh, and the cumulative impacts of these developments were just not being looked at at all. Um, the, um, the issue really was, I think, framed well by Monty Fisher, who was the, C the executive officer, director of Vermont Natural Resources at that time. And on the page one story in the New York Times in November of 1985, he said, quote, the law doesn't deal with the cumulative impact of a place like Killington. Killington's on a scale we've never seen before, and it's stretching the human and natural resources uh, to their limits. So VNRC decided to jump into that fight. They hired Beth Humstone there as their uh, expert planner. And they started petitioning for party status in virtually every Killington-related project. And Killington at that time was represented by the uh, 
same law firm that defended tort suits against the resort, and that firm brought a very highly litigious style um, to Act 250 proceedings before a local commission that really tried the patience and the capacity of the, uh, the volunteers who served in that commission. Uh, my colleague Harvey Carter and I represented the NRC in these actions, as well as in some cases the Connecticut River Watershed Council was involved, the town of Shrewsbury, uh, other attorneys involved were Mark Stefano, Jim Dumont, Mark Sinclair, and Bill Roper. Um, this battle over controlling the growth of Killington was largely, but not entirely, played out in Act 250. Uh, and the key precedent at the time these, this, these litigations started was a board decision in 1984 called In Re Bruce Levinsky. And that had been an application for construction of the second phase of a private sewer line that was intended to serve a subdivision. But the application only described you know, the pipe and what the excavation was going to be like. Uh, it didn't talk at all about the potential impacts that would be made possible by creating that infrastructure. Uh, and the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission and uh, two state agencies uh, took the position that that application was incomplete without any assessment of the impacts of the development that would be made possible by the construction of the sewage capacity. And the Environmental Board agreed and held that the sewer line and the proposed subdivision were a single project and the application must uh, describe details of the entire project, not just the mere construction of the sewer line. Uh, and so at Killington, that was the precedent that uh, the challengers to the resort wanted to apply to a, a, a ski area that was developing in many different ways. Uh, and uh, there was sustained and uh, fervent opposition from the resort. And this produced a highly contested hearings before the district commission. Uh, and it spilled over into statewide politics uh, with the ski area attacking the state of Vermont, its agencies, and its then new governor, Madeline Kuhn. And finally, the focus of a number of, of uh, there were a number of cases, but the one that really became the, the one that got most public attention and the focus of uh, the most, uh, I think, hotly debated hearings uh, involved a proposal by Killington to construct a pond for snowmaking in an undeveloped portion of the town amended called Parker's Door. Uh, and Killington took the position that this was an application to build a pond, but let's get going. Uh, and then we'll talk all about considering the scope of the development that would be made possible by this new snowmaking infrastructure. Um, and uh, there was seemingly endless procedural wrangling about whether this was a simple pond in the woods or the first step in a big development. Um, but it soon became clear that there was actually an overriding issue uh, related to this project, which was wildlife habitat. Uh, the reliance of black bears on wetland that was at the site of the proposed uh, pond site. Um, and as with, as the lawyers in the room know, and most of the planners know, in these cases, you end up with expert witnesses. Uh, and Killington hired a bear expert from Montana. And the state of Vermont was actively involved. The Department of Fish and Wildlife had some of its good biologists there, and also hired um, outside experts from Maine and Tennessee. Uh, and um, these experts, on one side and the other, could not agree on anything. Uh, the state and the uh, outside experts said this was an exceptionally rich bear habitat. It's very, very important. Uh, construction of the pond would destroy the habitat. The bears would be in peril. Uh, and the guy from Montana said, no, 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 no not true. No bears, no, no problem. Uh, and so you could see the frustration, and this was before the environmental board, of getting this testimony that just didn't uh, mesh at all. So on the third day of the hearing, as I remember it, um, Killington issued a challenge. They said, let's go out and look at the area. And the rest of us couldn't believe it. That was such a good idea that we never thought it would have come from them. But, but the, problem, the problem was that they had all these uh, environmental board members dressed up for a hearing, uh, you know, ready, ready to hear testimony. And uh, the issue was, would they be willing to go for a hike in the woods? And it pretty quickly became clear that, that they needed to get everybody along. And that was going to depend on our kid. Who, Diane mentioned, who was I, probably about 80 at that point. And so everybody looked at Art, and I said, I've got boots in my car. Let's go. <laughs> uh, and he went out to his car and got his boots. And we went tramping off into the woods. Um, and we got to the site, and the bear experts were about to start you know, talking and pointing things out to the commission 
when Art said, I think I found some evidence. And we all looked at him, and he was looking down in his boots, and sure enough, he had stepped in some very persuasive and clear evidence that bears were using that, <laughs> were, were, were using that habitat. Uh, and they went downhill for Killington the rest of the day, because there was evidence everywhere of this. And, uh, and, and luckily, Yvonne Daly from the Rutland Herald was there, and she wrote a story about it the next day, a third page one of the Rutland Herald. So pretty soon, this, the whole state knew about it. Uh, and that, that really solved the factual issues. And once those were solved, it was pretty clear, I thought, where the case was going to go. But it took two years and a Supreme Court decision uh, to get it there. Uh, and ultimately, uh, Parker Square is now a conserved area. Um, the, the pond was never built. Um, Killington was able to get the snowmaking infrastructure he wanted by going to Woodard Reservoir in Plymouth working with the dam owner there who I ended up representing. And we worked out, uh, with the help of the state, an arrangement where they have a, a source of water that doesn't involve uh, constructing in, in uh, Parker's Gore. Uh, a number of these cases ended up at the E-Board, and it did apply the Levinsky principle. Uh, the board held in one case that, where, oh, I'm going to read this, where there exists a growth facility, clear evidence of a plan for growth beyond what was presented in the application, and a direct relationship between growth and the proposed construction, an application may be deemed incomplete until additional information about the overall master development plan is submitted for commission review. Uh, and the commission can then convene a hearing in the merits to decide the scope of the project, and the commission may obtain more information in order to adequately evaluate the project. So you can talk later today about whether master planning is being effectively uh, applied and is still arguments about what the scope of the project is, and particularly what information is relevant. Uh, and I was at Killington with, uh, with some people here in this room three years ago, and we had a long, long proceeding on for a week about what the scope of the traffic study should be in connection with a new phase. So these, uh, these issues always get played out in the facts of the case. Uh, but uh, Killington and other skiers, I think, are doing a much better job uh, of, of looking at the, at the big picture. And it certainly helps the developers to get decisions on uh, uh, compliance with some of the criteria in advance so they know that they have more than one phase will meet the, uh, will meet the standards. Uh, Act 250 was not the only arena where these issues played out. The Water Resources Board, now gone, uh, decided a major case uh, involving septic disposal and the impact of water uh, in these high altitude uh, uh, developments. And, uh, it was a case called, that involved the Sunrise Development, which is also at Killington. They built a large treatment plant. They got a uh, permit from the agency. Uh, and um, we, had, we were, my, my partner Harvey Carter and I took an appeal to the Water Resources Board. And the question was whether um, water that came through a spray field and then discharged into the surface water, even if it was chemically and biologically uh, clean uh, require an NPDES discharge permit uh, and, and could it get one. Uh, and uh, there's a case that was decided by an evidentiary objection. We objected to an uh, expert talking about the quality of the water because we said it wasn't, re wasn't relevant, it was waste, uh, and it needed a permit. Uh, they sustained the objection, and uh, all of a sudden, a, uh, a fully developed treatment plant wasn't going to be usable. Uh, and that um, that got the attention of a lot of people. Uh, it's in the front page of the New York Times. Uh, I went back and found the article. It's interesting. It says, the ruling effectively halts expansion at most of Vermont's other ski areas and brought to a climax a long dispute over whether the resort's growth in recent years benefits the state's economy or threatens its main attraction, the Green Mountains. And uh, the result of that was the legislature came, dealt with it effectively and swiftly by enacting rules for indirect discharge permits and, and bringing clarity to, what the, uh, to how in-ground uh, uh, large septic systems should be developed, but particularly in high mountain areas. Uh, and they got, eventually got to use their septic system, but the development community and people concerned about growth had clear rules. But they only came out, in this case isn't so many others, because of litigation that forced issues to be heard. Um, the New York Times is not the only, um, the only publication covering all this. Ski Magazine got involved, and uh, they declared that Vermont was, quote, in a state of civil war 
between Governor Kunin and the resort owners. Um, and I'm going to read a short quote from ski, the ski article I'm talking about. And uh, please feel free to hiss after I read it. Um, it said, quote, Governor Kunin, a Democrat, immigrant, female Jewish, was elected to, in 1984, the state historically and overwhelmingly fond of none of the above. If you can believe that. But you get the flavor. It was, thank you for hissing. It was, it was, it, there were some really ugly dimensions to this. And the district commission, district commission number one, had to hear all these hearings, was really in a tough position. They were in a highly charged political atmosphere that was getting statewide and, and broader attention. And they were just trying to figure out what Act 250 meant and how to apply it. Uh, so finally, I just, for, at least for some of the lawyers here, I just want to go over, talk about some of the other sort of collateral ways that these types of, of disputes played out in the press and the public arena. Uh, Killington sued VNRC to subpoena its membership list and governance information in an attempt to, to deny uh, party status. Uh, result, subpoena quashed, didn't go forward. Uh, Killington filed a petition in Superior Court for an extraordinary writ to seek to force the district commission to proceed on an application in the narrow form filed by Killington rather than asking broader questions. Result, writ denied. Um, uh, a sideshow in this whole thing was Killington's proposal to make snow from treated effluent. Uh, this did not play well in the realm, in the realm of public relations. Um, the Times Argus published a cartoon showing two Killington skiers carrying toilet plungers. Um, and the caption read, uh-oh, looks like those snow-making machines are clogged again. Uh, Killington did not think this was funny. They sued the Times Argus for defamation. Uh, I, don't, I don't recall the outcome. I wasn't involved in that, but I don't think they collected. Um, and then someone created a bumper sticker that read, quote, Killington, where the affluent meet the effluent. <laughs> and um, shortly after that was available, a, a carpenter in one of the condos at Killington slapped it on his truck showed up for work and his boss saw the sticker and fired him like that. Says, you're, you're out of here. Uh, his name was Cowboy Snodgrass. Um, he uh, went to the ACLU Vermont. The ACLU Vermont called a cooperating attorney who was my partner, Steve Saltonstall. Some of you may remember Steve. Uh, and Steve um, brought an action. Uh, and that ended up in the New York Times also. And Steve, ever quotable, said, quote, it seems to me as if an employee can, cannot speak his mind on political issues then they become like serfs in the Middle Ages, unquote. Uh, the result of that was cowboy collected. So that's a quick glance back at a time when Act 250 took center stage in a highly politicized public debate about growth uh, and the issues that uh, uh, were debated then seem somewhat familiar in different contexts today. Thank you. So, uh, so we now have time for a, a, a ten-minute break, um, and then we'll we'll uh, reconvene. I, uh, knowing that this group is such a uh, um, misbehaviors, um, maybe I'll say you've got a five-minute break, and then five minutes to transition back to your seats. So, run and find the toilets, and then come back. Thank you, everyone. Well, we're going to move into the the next phase of of this conversation. I'm delighted to be able to introduce Ann Galloway, who will, will lead and moderate this discussion. And thanks to her, both, both um, for uh, the support of BT Digger for this event, but also for her amazing efforts. You know, she has poured her life and heart into making BT Digger a success at a time when, as we all know, journalism and media is under, under major strains from so many different ways. And, and steadfast commitment to having um, good, strong, valuable uh, journalists with integrity in the state has been an amazing contribution to our democracy here in Vermont. Um, I also deeply appreciate her willingness to moderate this coming panel and to take time away from her busy schedule to be with us. So with that, Ann Galloway. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you all so much. Um, this panel uh, has some uh, amazing folks who know an awful lot about Act 250 and how it affects their businesses and uh, how they operate in the world. Um, our format today opens with each panelist offering 90-second remarks. 
Following the 90 seconds, yeah, we're going to keep to that, right, Teresa? Um, following the opening remarks, each panelist will take the lead on one question from me, um, ending with a lightning round um, where each panelist will quickly list their top issues regarding Act 250. Following the discussion, there will be 15 minutes, and we really do mean we'll get to this 15 minutes of Q&A, okay? So here we go. Um, I'm going to introduce the panelists. Um, we're going to start with uh, Kathy Beyer on the end, who is the Vice President of Development for Housing Vermont. She's worked in the real estate and community development industry for over 25 years, and she holds a Master's in Public Administration from the Harvard Kennedy School. Bob Duncan, who uh, is closer to me here on the, on the right, remembers Dean Davis campaigning for governor in 1968 as a proponent of statewide land use regulation, a graduate of Pennsylvania State University and a founding principal of Duncan Wis Wisniewski Architecture in Burlington, established in 1985. His first exposure to the Act 250 process was in 1984. His firm has experienced the entire gamut of the process, including lengthy appeals. Mark Delaney in the center uh, is the Chief Mountain and Corporate Matters Officer at Smuggler's Notch Resort. He's been employed at Smuggler's since 1978 and is responsible for planning, permitting, environmental compliance, construction management, and mountain operations, among other duties. He has led the resort's Act 250 work since 1987. He served on the Town of Cambridge Planning Commission, the Conservation Commission, and was a longtime member of the Lamoille County Planning Commission Board of Directors. Jeannie Morrissey, um, to, to Kathy's right, is the president of J.A. Morrissey Incorporated, a general contracting and construction management company headquartered in Williston, Vermont. Ms. Morrissey has managed a variety of project types, sizes, and contracts over 37 years as both a contractor and in her early career as a public works engineer. Jeannie is a graduate of the University of Vermont and a licensed civil engineer in Vermont and California. All right. Um, so, we are going to start with Jeannie. Jeannie, would you trade more stringent protections for the public? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Darn. <laughs> now you guys get to talk again. Okay, 90 seconds. Kathy, opening remarks. Sorry about that, guys. Thanks, Anne. Um, so, as you heard, I'm a real estate developer. I'm a nonprofit real estate developer. And I believe that the question each community in Vermont needs to ask simultaneously is where should we conserve our land and our natural areas, and where should Vermonters live and work? Too often, the first question is answered. Let's face it, it's the easy one. We all feel warm and fuzzy when we drive past and see the sign, this land is conserved forever. I think at its core, Act 250 does try to answer both questions, um, but on a project by project basis and criteria by criteria. It's the best that we have, but it does not allow for a broader vision of a project, of a project in the context of the community. So I think a lot of what today is about, and you've already heard some of that, is, is a reflection on, on um, uh, the planning and regulatory tools that are in place now, in place now as compared to 1970, and in that context of very robust community planning and a much changed state permitting process at the Agency of Natural Resources, what is the appropriate role for Act 50 today to help us answer both questions? Thank you very much. Mark is next. Hi, I've been working with Act 250 years. Um, and uh, since 1987, I was mentored by Ed Stanner, uh, who guided me very well over the years. Thank you, Ed. Um, and, but I have to say, maybe it's a function of my advancing age, but I miss the uh, simple days when an application was only a couple pages long. You could write your own criteria narrative. You didn't have the 25-page Schedule B one-size-fits-all form to deal with and the fees were a lot less. I think Act 250 should be the first stop on a project's path through the regulatory process, not the last. I think the applicant should be able to present conceptual plans and enough evidence to support positive findings on select or all criteria. I think the parties should be gotten on the record. 
I think the big picture issues should get settled and then um, issue a permit conditional upon the receipt of the ANR technical permits. This way the applicant can make changes if needed before they are fully vested in the um, costly engineering required for the technical permits and can have some surety that the project will move forward. All the ANR technical permits these days include some opportunity for public comment or interaction and give the parties an opportunity to participate. Act 250 has had many positive benefits to projects I've been involved with over the years, and a lot of that occurred when life was simpler. Thank you very much, Jean. So essentially, uh, my experience with Act 250 is working for a lot of owners that have experienced a lot of impacts. Um, that is in the healthcare sector, the manufacturing sector, the business service sector, the affordable housing sector, and as a Vermonter, not as a contractor, but as a Vermonter, I, I have to say that uh, the complexities of any law, and I think it's the price of democracy is that laws are complicated, is that the more time that passes between when a law is enacted uh, and the current time you're in, the greater the distance from the original intention of that law. And my hope of what comes out of today is that the collaboration of the folks in this room, some of the follow-up, and the work with uh, the legislature and with the board that results in one or two or three or four small but bold but courageous but simple outcomes <laughs> that assist so that something happens, something small good, perhaps a shift in the paradigm. And I also want to give a shout out, not just to the lawmakers, but to the staff. I would like to see every public employee who has to serve in the issuance of permits and in the reviews, who's being asked to go faster, to be supported. Because as a former public employee, I said, you know, these are the folks on the front lines that actually this group might want to be talking to about how do we make things better, how do we make things more efficient, are the people on the front lines. And the last thing I just wanted to point out is that on the cover of this pamphlet, I did notice it says, Act 250, protecting Vermont's environment, promoting economic prosperity. I do think if that linkage is to be real, then we should really be talking about how to link it up because because I would like to see an economy that, as Diane mentioned, we can all, that everybody can enjoy, can enjoy this state. And I wonder what it would read like, promoting Vermont's environment, promoting economic prosperity. Thank you, Jeannie. Bob? Thank you, Ann. Uh, when I was asked to serve on this panel and to think about what Act 250 meant uh, and its importance to the landscape and the development of this beautiful state, I was immediately reminded of the opening paragraph of Charles Dickens' The Tale of Two Cities, which uh, probably most of you have read or may be familiar with. Uh, I was surprised to learn that it's the second most popular book in the world. And I'll just read you that first paragraph, because I think for me it epitomizes a lot about what Act 50 has become and what it is. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was a season of light. It was a season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. And so in my mind, Act 50 represents a paradox, which is what that paragraph, of course, is all about. And it's necessary to frame the parameters by which we plan land use development in Vermont. It is unnecessarily complex and in some ways redundant and overlapping of local and regional planning, part of what uh, Kathy was alluding to. So in Dickensian terms, what I would say is the good thing about Act 250 is that it slows down development. And the bad thing about Act 250 is that it slows down development. <laughs> And so I think the starting point of discussion for the future of Act 250 is how do we reconcile the good and the bad into a unified whole 
that does more than slow the process of development, but rather improves the process of development and support the vision we have for our future. And I brought a show and tell with me just to sort of exemplify that. So this is the total application for the Plainfield Health Center in 1977. And that's how big it is. And in 2007, we built an addition to the Plainfield Health Center. <laughs> and this is the application. And I know a lot of things changed over time. Uh, there, there wasn't any stormwater regulation in this application, and there certainly was in this application. But for me, that's a, a good visual that shows that things have changed to a point that's harder, it's much, much harder to go through the process and prepare for the process. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, now we'll get to the questions. Uh, Jamie, would you trade more stringent protections for the public values captured in the Act 250 criteria in return for more certainty for a more efficient process? So the, the, the entire question of um, reduction of, of protecting the environment, I think, is, is a little bit misplaced. I, I think that, you know, again, listening to uh, some of the, the horror stories, and as Bob says, the good that has come, and thank, thank God for Act 250 and many of the blessings to, the, to our environment and, and what would we have done without it. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that um, we, we can't begin to revisit what, is it, what does it mean to, um, to meet the, the to, to, look at, to look at a more, in a more broad sense that we don't have to sacrifice the environment for a more certain process. Um, we don't have to sacrifice the environment for a more efficient process. I think, I think what we do need to do is look at how do we have a more efficient process? How do we have a more certain process? And we talked, the four of us have talked amongst ourselves about a variety of different ways to begin to look at that. But in part, I wanted to offer an example of, of, a, of an experience I had last week where I met an owner who has a, has a, a business that is a is about to explode in Vermont, and it is a sustainable business. It's an awesome Vermont-based business. Who wanted to um, to purchase a piece of property in a downtown? Didn't want so the employees could walk to work. And eleventh hour, and I, I wasn't involved in the initial details. I'm just getting involved in this now. But the time, but it was subject to Act 250 because of a previous subdivision. Uh, a subdivision of the property and looked at the time frame and now a, a, an alternative site is being pursued because it won't be subject to Act 250. And so I was looking at this and I was saying to myself, well, is that a less stringent protection of the environment or is that um, an aspect of an, uh, that is not captured in the process? Because that, we can calculate the impacts, we can regulate certain things, we can promote certain things, we can measure energy consumption. There's a whole lot of things we can do. But there are, there are also other things and, uh, that can be calculated that are good for the environment. And so for me, I would like to see that the mindset that no, we don't need to sacrifice anything for a more efficient process or a more certain process, but we may have to change things. And, and I know that the board is working on that now, whether it is the process, the timing, the, uh, the flow chart, um, but for, for a private sector owner to make a decision about buying a piece of property with the uncertainty for, for, for them to make an investment, it is, it is extremely difficult. And so, Anything that can be done to look at creating exemptions where you may have an Act 250, um, an Act 250 circumstance where it would apply, but maybe we look at the parameters and say, we, we are getting so many of the things that we wanted, this is an anomalous situation. Maybe there's a quick turnaround hearing board. Maybe there's, there's a way to shift things. And I'm not expecting this overnight, but I'm thinking, um, Anything to accelerate things without giving something up should be enacted first. Okay, 
Okay, next question is for Kathy. What changes to Act 250 would make it easier to invest in town centers and villages? So, um, as a residential developer and as a developer who spends a lot of time in uh, downtowns, I can tell you that um, the, the exemption for priority housing in designated downtowns and neighborhood development areas is working. And um, it, my company benefits from it um, often. And I know for some people, they think, oh, an exemption from Act 250, you, you know, why does this keep happening? It's not a good thing. But actually, I believe these exemptions are exactly tied to what we've been, we want, what we want is where we have extensive community planning around the designated downtown, around neighborhood development areas, and, th and because of that, we have this, act this exemption from Act 250. I actually think it could be expanded beyond priority housing projects because of the amount of planning that goes around those designated areas. That, for me, is the biggest incentive for um, developing in downtowns. And I will tell you, developing in a downtown is one of the uh, most expensive and risky things that we do. In a, in a downtown, it's not um, unusual to find out there's a misunderstanding around where the property lines are about a parcel that has been in use for over 100 years. There's uh, challenges around construction, as Jeannie can attest to, when you're trying to develop on this tight site. There's no room for staging. There's truck traffic. You have to close down the public sidewalk. Um, it's, it's a really challenging thing to do to, de to develop in a downtown. And sometimes there's aging municipal infrastructure where the town actually wasn't quite sure where that stormwater line was or where that water and sewer line was that complicates things. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. And there are a long list of incentives. I actually went online and there's a spreadsheet with a list of incentives. So I think it's an area that, that both um, the, uh, eight, the state has done a, a, a good job on encouraging this. And I would just, I would just say um, keep at it because it is challenging, but it is where our Vermonters should be living and working. Mark, would you be willing to consider increasing Act 250 jurisdiction in areas where there's a strong public interest in conserving the land in return for reduced jurisdiction in village centers and downtowns? Well, I can certainly support reduction of Act 250 jurisdiction, <laughs> especially in village centers and downtowns as part of a comprehensive package of incentives that are offered to encourage development and renovation in those areas and prevent sprawl, providing the community has appropriate planning and regulatory processes in place. I think we should evaluate which criteria are better handled at the municipal level and delegate that review to them. However, coming from a ski area, my initial reaction is to, I think, is to increasing jurisdiction um, is negative. Uh, uh, I tell most of my staff, as I mentioned to Diane earlier, that if we want to sneeze at a ski resort, we need an Act 250 permit for that. Um, however, uh, I think Act 250 has proven itself to be a thorough and comprehensive pro process. Good project planning and development should be rewarded, not impeded. And we can't expect every project to uh, belong in an existing downtown or village center. That being said, I think the jurisdictional triggers should be examined. A lot of the inappropriate development that takes place out there, I think, is happening beneath the one in 10 acre thresholds. And in particular, the cumulative effects of those projects not being covered by Act 250 is not being taken into account. Um, I recently had an opportunity to read some comments put together by David Mears, who advanced the concept of critical areas. Um, and I think that's on the right track. I think we also need to be mindful of the economic impacts. The Act 250 process, as Bob alludes to, has been uh, becoming more and more expensive and time consuming. It's difficult for individual landowners and entrepreneurs to navigate on their own. And I believe that ultimately works against Vermonters. It favors corporate entities with deep enough pockets to, re to hire their required consultants and attorneys. I believe that a strong economy, which is possible with some growth in, in development, is a cornerstone of environmental protection. 
I think also the matter of redundancy in our state and local land use regulatory processes has to be addressed. It's inordinately time consuming, not just for applicants, but for the interested parties, for the regulators. It's costly and it's allowing multiple bites at the same apple. And by the way, I do think the ski resort should be eligible to receive Grove Center or Village Center designation. Has Act 250 had a positive impact on your projects? Have there been some negative impacts? And what are some examples besides the Plainfield uh, Center? Yeah, and, and that actually wasn't a negative impact except for time and, and effort to produce the application. Um, in my practice uh, as an architect, probably the minority of our projects are subject to Act 250. So my experience in terms of impact on them uh, is, is limited Every project we approach, we, we do the best we can to balance budgets, balance clients' needs, zoning regulations, activity regulations, and so on. So when we when we get to the to the process, uh, we've ne never actually had an application changed under Act 250 or any project changed uh, for either the better or the worse as far as the application process is concerned. Because I think we strive to do everything that all of the uh, rules and regulations require of us. Uh, but having said that, I'm familiar with some, uh, some Act 250 applications that I think have been impacted positively. The one that comes to mind for me, and many of you may remember, especially if you're from northwestern Vermont, is the Pyramid Mall application in Williston uh, in the late 80s. And I'm grateful that didn't happen. I think that's largely a result of Act 250. At the same time, I'm not really sure that the development that succeeded it is dramatically better, but that's a, that's a different conversation. But the, but the negative impacts of Act 250, uh, I think, have to do with the application process itself. Uh, as I showed in my show and tell earlier, you know, an application process, you know, 25 or 30 years ago was the equivalent of a 15 or 20 page term paper that every, probably everyone in this room has had to do multiple times. And now it can easily be 10 or 15 or 20 times that. And it's not unusual to have 200, 300, 400 page applications Act 250. So it, it has become a complicated process. And that, that, has, that has cost, that has time that, uh, in, in terms of the application process itself, uh, having to issue service to multiple municipalities and governing boards and DRBs and planning commissions and so on, all as a burden that I think and I hope we can come up with a way to simplify. Um, <clears throat> in, in addition, uh, the, the, the law itself is relatively complex. Uh, I think maybe there's some ways to simplify that because there is a lot of overlap with local zoning applications and there are municipalities in the state that have very little in the way of zoning. There are municipalities in the state that have pretty uh, good zoning ordinances that actually cover almost all of what Act 250 covers. Burlington is an example of that with its, uh, with its criteria for a zoning application. Much of the Act 250 application, if you had to do one in Burlington, most times now you don't have to, uh, there's a lot of redundancy there, and therefore it seems like it's just a waste of time. But the biggest negative impact for Act 250, and I, and I think we need to figure out a way to address this, I don't want to diminish uh, anybody's opportunity to appeal, but the appeal process can be just downright onerous. It's expensive, uh, it takes a lot of legal time, it takes a lot of time. We've had one project that went years because the environmental court does not have any time limits or any constraints. The, the judge rules when the judge rules. And so one project that we had that was actually through Housing Vermont in Woodstock was years and years in the appeals process. And I know they had in Burlington about 15 years ago. Uh, didn't go that long in the appeals process, but the negative impact it ultimately had was on the quality of the buildings that got built. So we had to exchange essentially legal fees for building materials. So whereas we would have had more durable building materials, the length of time that it took, the cost of legal fees, basically come out of the project budget. So if a project has a budget of, pick a number, $5 million, and if the appeals process costs $200,000 to get through legal fees in time and inflationary costs, then that $200,000 comes from that $5 million. So the project, even though it will still comply with Act 250, there are things that happen that make the, the building maybe not as durable, maybe not as long-lasting, 
And I think that's a really serious implication to think about for our environment itself. Well, you guys are great. I mean, we're now at 10:26. Um, we're ahead of schedule, so I think we're gonna have plenty of time for Q and A. And I, I, I think we've got an eager audience here. So let's go on to the lightning round. We've got six, 60 seconds or less to list your top issues pertaining to Act 250. We're gonna start with Mark. Okay. Um, I think the criteria need to be looked at because I think technical permits from A and R have um, uh, superseded some of the criteria. We could eliminate some of them, perhaps, or change them and streamline that. Um, I'd like to see a little more consistency between districts, um, both administratively and in terms of commission behavior. I think we need to strengthen commission training, and I think we need to support better staffing levels. Um, I think we could look at ways of developing better ways to integrate A&R, E-Trans, Department of Ag, Historic Preservation into the Act 250 process. Um, I think we need to be able to speed up review times, set some time frames and enforce them to create some better predictability. Um, did I use up 60 seconds yet? I can't no, no, no. <laughs> um, how about, on appeals, I think we should be placing the burden of proof on the appellant, whether that be the applicant or the opponent. Uh, lastly, I think we got to look at Criterion 10, local and regional plans. I think those documents tend to be too vague and aspirational at times. Um, I think they need to be implementable, uh, perhaps rolled into municipal regulations in order to be meaningful within the Act 250 context. Thank you. Jeannie? Essentially, I would, I think that the most important thing is to look for the most immediate change for simplicity. What, what can come first so that this doesn't become an ongoing conversation, but is there a way to have quicker turnarounds on administrative work, whether that be a staffing increase? How, how much can we do quickly? I also, uh, I, I'm not sure I know the how, but I, I do believe that, uh, you know, inside of some of Bob and what Mark have said that, um, and some of what Kathy said about the incentives, that, that you, we do have a lot of very good uh, players in Vermont. We have a, a, a lot of very good owners, a lot of very good architects, people who are willing and, and ready and desirous of meeting the spirit of the law uh, on their own. And, and just to be revisiting Act 250 from the sense of how protectionist it is and how fearful of the bad guy it is and look at is there actually such a way as looking at not just protecting against the bad guy but also looking how to reward the good guy, whether that is increased exemptions or an accelerated process for somebody who has a complete application or shifting around the burden of of, of liability uh, uh, of proving, but mostly, mostly I think that we need to begin to view ourselves as a whole because at the end of the day, um, the environment is very important, the economy is incredibly important for, for every dollar spent here. It has to be seen as a holistic dollar. Thank you very much. Bob? So for me, I think the, the main point is simplicity, and I don't know exactly how we get to that, but I think there are ways to do that. Uh, one of the examples that, uh, that is in Act 250 Criterion 9F, which is energy conservation. So if it's an Act 250 application has to actually be 10% better than the energy codes that have been <coughs> implemented in Vermont. And I really struggle with that because I think the energy codes that we have are uh, at least, at, be, at least adequate, we always try to do much better than the energy code in any project that we do. And I don't think Act 250 should be any different than any other project in Vermont. If we think as Vermonters that we should have a code that is stricter than what's been adopted for Act 250, and we should, and we should in, uphold all projects of that standard. So I don't think we need to make something a, a bigger threshold for Act 250, which leads me to my point, my next point, which is, I don't think Act 250 should be seen as a burden. And right now, I think in many avenues, it's seen as a burden. It's seen as something I have to get through. It's, it's, a, it's a long process and so on. 
Act 250 should be something that we hold dear and because it is important to our land use planning and to what the state that, that we want to be. And I, I think we need to come up with a way to perceive Act 250 as part of a process that really is, benefits us all instead of as a hassle for some. Thank you. Very pithy. Okay, Kathy. So I'm going to suggest something that um, kind of takes on the holy grail um, from the original language of uh, uh, the 1970 law that a jurisdic jurisdictional threshold for housing is 10 units or more. And I would suggest that in 2018 is that the appropriate um, threshold for housing, particularly if we look at um, communities with extensive planning and um, and in, in particular, in, compar in comparison to the commercial threshold, which seems to be, there's, there's, there doesn't seem to be equity there. The impact of 10 units of housing versus what, it, what it, how you trigger um, Active 50 on the commercial side. So I actually think that is a place that we could have a discussion. Um, and this, the second area is what I mentioned is, is just how do we continue to emphasize this link between planning and um, the Act 250 process. I, I know we'd all like to go back to or lament the fact that the state land use development plan was not passed and that um, if only that had happened, things would be so much better. I'm not sure about that, but let's celebrate what we have today and see if we can um, continue to, to uh, strengthen those links between our planning on the community level and the activity permit process. Thank you very much. Let's open it up for questions. Um, anybody? <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Annette Smith from Honors for a Clean Environment. A number of you have talked about community level planning. And I want to share with you an observation from my town, Danby, and what's happened in the last decade. And I've come to appreciate more of a regional and state level review process as a result of it. Um, the town has a village center designation. It is a historic village. It's where Pearl Buck decided to settle. Uh, in her retirement years. And uh, after she died, someone bought all the houses that she had bought and fixed them all up, looked like a movie set. Uh, there used to be, and I call it what it used to be now, uh, two operating inns, three antique stores, uh, a general store, and a, a couple other stores. At the same time over the last decade, as these businesses were in operation, we had a grandfathered gravel pit that then started blasting and then added crushing and uh, turned into a quarry and an asphalt plant. And so homes have been damaged. There's asphalt fumes in the middle of the night. And I've heard stories of people having to leave the antique store. Uh, and because of the blasting, it's now under Active 50. And if you go to Google Earth and look, you can see the huge impact on the land right next to our village center. Now we have no operating inns, no operating businesses. The general store closed. Uh, it's it's a, a very good case study of what happened. Now, uh, what can happen even when there's Act 250 involved. On the municipal level, when we were doing our town plan in 2015, the uh, applicant where the quarry was seeking an amendment. And he came to every meeting and so did the neighbors. I was reprimanded in a letter from the Chair of the Planning Commission for using the word encroach. I said that the quarry was encroaching on the village. And that was a bad thing to do. So what I've seen is that when you get down to the municipal level, you can have people who are friends. And they're going to support their friends. and. Yes, this quarry is providing some jobs. Nobody really knows how many. But 
how do we get at this, some people call it the good old boy network, that is still very prevalent in so many towns and not necessarily achieving the goals that we are talking about here. Well, I think one thing I would say is that I think that's where Act 250 has an important role in that it's a regional approach as opposed to a local approach. I, I did a lot of outreach um, since my permitting in Act 250 experience is pretty narrowly focused over the years on, on smugglers specifically. I reached out to a lot of people in preparing for uh, today, and a lot of what I heard was um, the redundancy issue, which I alluded to previously, um, but I also heard a lot of people saying that they thought that the level of expertise and the level of bias at the local or municipal level tended to be greater. Um, I, I'm sure that can vary widely from town to town, but perhaps that's where um, Act 250 can play a stronger role, and we can perhaps roll back some of the um, uh, local and municipal regulatory processes. So in your case, was, was the, uh, the expansion of the gravel pit, which is essentially, I think, extraction of earth resources, uh, was that not, were you not at an Act 250 level hearing for that, where you were experiencing this? Yeah, Act 250 yeah. becomes complicated. Yeah. And yeah. It, to me, it's, it's not about who's administering Act 250, mm -hmm. it's the, the overall structure. This is a good case study of how it hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this, this is something that did ultimately come under Act 250. However, that original operation is grandfathered. It has no limit on its permit. It can blast and extract forever, right next to our village center. And the quarry owner is now, I think, the owner of the, one of the historic inns. Uh, his mother owns the store that just shut. So it's, it's, a, it's an increasing sort of uh, creep of the lack of, 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 the, of the, the, the vision of village centers and a uh, healthy economy. So yes, it, it has been through Act 250 with permanent amendments, but it has only enabled the expansion of the operation with some conditions. Did the original uh, operation precede Act 250? The original operation was a grandfather gravel pit. So that's the governance of the road. Yeah. So this is another issue that I think we all need to look at is what things have been carved out. The slate quarries are not under Act 250. Extraction, obviously, is a big impact on communities. And uh, we, we have a lot of it in Rutland County. And I think our district commission is very good at dealing with these impacts. But this is a very odd situation and one that I'm just watching, you know, also on Route 7. This is another, I think, larger issue for the state is that our rural <coughs> communities are dying. We used to have all kinds of businesses along Route 7, right, there in the Indian Mount Tabor. Virtually all of them gone now. So the sorts of things that people, tourists would come to Vermont for to see, this is Vermont, the gift shops, the, all these things, that are, they don't exist anymore in these uh, rural areas. And it's happening all over the state. probably an example of we've been talking about the areas where Act 250 might be able to do less and there's obviously places where it could still do more. Is that that part of the conversation is both ends of the spectrum and every specific story brought into the conversation I think helps illuminate what should be thought of. We have a question from Amy in the center here. Thanks a lot. Um, I, I'm so grateful for your input. I listened to your top issues, and a lot of them are focused on how we can ease um, restrictions on development. And I think the, the real question for me is, what are the environmental resources of statewide significance that you think could use more protection? Um, I think there's been some conversation around sub-jurisdictional impacts. That's one of the big things we're struggling with. 
how to address those. So I would really appreciate hearing from you all. What are those environmental resources of statewide significance where you would be willing to see more environmental protections in place? So from my perspective, uh, what I would like to see is preservation of open space and, 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 and focused development in our, in our downtowns and our villages. Uh, the strip development that we see happening all over the state, and it happens in pretty much every community, and more and more of it's happening at interstate exchanges. I think those are unfortunate patterns of development. Some of that is subject to 250 and some of it isn't. When, and when I talk about uh, simplicity in Act 250, it's not necessarily to uh, make development easier. It's, um, I, I think it's to make development better, but also to make it less costly, to, um, to improve the process so that it's more predictable. Uh, I think that I actually had a, someone in Act 250 level talk to me about how, you know, 96 or something percent of Act 250 applications get approved, and that's probably true. I think there are a lot of applications that never get made because they may not make it through or a person doesn't perceive the ability to actually have the funds to get through Act 250 process. So I think that the, um, what that means to me is that if most applications get approved and they get approved more or less as they were uh, submitted, then I wonder what the process is really doing for us. Because for me, I don't see I don't see design improvements through Act 250 in terms of buildings. I don't really think the buildings are necessarily better designed or, or as they're approved, they're better designed or impacted positively. So I just wonder what Act 250 is really ultimately doing for us if 98% of the projects get approved and many of them without much in any, of any substantial changes. So does that just mean that it costs money and it takes time and if you have money and time, you can get a project approved? That's a question I have, uh, so I don't really, I, I wonder what positive impact in many cases Act 250 has on application other than to slow it down. And, and I think that one of the things about Act 250 that, that it uh, does do, and I, and I alluded to that earlier, is that uh, the good thing is that it slows down development, and the bad thing is that it slows down development. And I think that helps uh, in, in the, the economic swings that we experience. Uh, other states in boom times are doing project after project, and things are happening, happening, and then all of a sudden there's 50,000 square feet of commercial space that's vacant. Act 250 does have a modulating impact on development in the state that I think prevents a lot of that from happening, and I think that's that's a fortunate um, part of Act 250 is that it does help to modulate development. But I, I don't want to have my comments misconstrued as saying that I, I want to see this change so the development can happen more development can happen or it cannot happen faster. I just would like it to be more predictable and more efficient and cost less for clients and, and ultimately for all of our miners. I mean, your, your question is around where, how Act 250 can help um, preserve state, state areas of statewide significance, natural areas of statewide significance. Um, it's interesting, I, I'm not sure that's, a role Act 250 can take on all by itself. Um, you know, I, I think I'm sure every, every one of us in this room can think of that natural area in your community or um, the, the place that you go to um, that's that's important and and the the protection of those resources. Um, I think can't just be a regulatory protection. It's a conversation we have to have um, in a in a broader level, I th which I think Vermont. Maybe I'm naive, but I think Vermont does a pretty good job of it through either our land conservation efforts, um, through our in in part through some of the jurisdictional thresholds around Act 250 and developing above 2,500 feet of elevation. Um, so, I, I guess I would just say, I think that's a bigger question than Act 250 alone can protect. And I just wanted to be clear, I, with the exception of the notation about the stretch code where it does make sense to me also that we have one energy code in Vermont, not a more stringent energy code for Act 250, other than that I don't see I, and I hope I didn't misspeak, an, a need for less st 
stringent requirements, just more promotion of the efficiencies and the risk taking and the decision making moments in the process. Again, not to have a project be less, but to be less expensive. And and in, and I guess I agree somewhat with Kathy that I I see the promotion of the improvement of the natural landscape because in 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 every facet on on the municipal level you know in all the local community land trusts and through public private partnership and through everything that's happening with the farms I think it's a we we just have an ongoing conversation about the environment the economy the community the Vermont that that we live in I mean I feel like inside of our work everybody is uh, stretched to the to to the max just trying to just trying to make what's happened happen um, I think c the consciousness of everybody involved that's probably the greatest impact of Act 250 I would say as a collective people Vermonters are much more aware for all the reasons that that Bob indicated uh, one specific area that I think could be addressed in, in some of the ANR folks here may be able to comment on this because it may already be, um, but that's <clears throat> in terms of the landscape scale uh, impact, I think um, wildlife travel corridors are one that we could and should be looking at. Thank you. Looks like we've got two, two questions here. Hi, um, my name is Lonnie Raven, and um, there's two things where I see Act 250 going towards, and I'd like to get your um, comments on that, and I think those two things are going against the idea of simplification <laughs> and shortening the process without sacrificing quality. And one of them is the electronic submission that Act 250 is going towards. Um, what I've seen that means is that an application can be thousands of pages long, and you can submit it electronically, it's not a problem. And I've seen that happen, and I'm wondering, how can staff even review those thousands of pages? Uh, you know, Jeannie, you were talking about, you know, more staff, and if the applications are thousands of pages long, there's no way that anybody can meaningfully review that. So, like, what's the point? The second thing is, um, if I'm mistaken, please let me know, but what, something I heard is that Act 250 is going towards not accepting an application until all the stormwater and A&R permits have been approved. That would lengthen the process. Instead of three five month long processes going on concurrently, that would make each one go serially, and that would really lengthen the process. Um, if I'm mistaken in that, please let me know, but that's what I heard. So I wanted to know, A, is that true, and B, what do you think about that? Thank you. <laughs> I believe it to be true, and I am, uh, that's why I say I really think that the a and technical permits should be made conditional, that you should be able to get your Act 250 permit conditional upon receipt of the ANR technical permits. I think the applicant should be able to run concurrent um, applications or at least get some surety from Act 250 before they invest the money required to get those technical permits. And, and I do want to reiterate, I believe most, if not all, of the ANR technical permits nowadays require a public notice process and can invoke a public hearing. I hadn't thought about the electronic submission as, as being a limitless uh, flow of, of, uh, of paperwork, but uh, it, it did occur to me when, when electronic submission was, was mentioned that it would sure cut down uh, no pun intended, on the number of trees that have to be cut down uh, to file an active 50 application. So I saw that as probably a positive benefit, but I didn't think of it in terms of uh, whether, whether a human being could actually process that application. Um, my understanding of the ANR stormwater uh, receipt before the active 50 application was that there was a guarantee of time 
uh, from the, for the issuance of the Act 250 permit once you had all those in place. And maybe I'm mistaken about that, but I thought there was a mention of a 45 day turnaround time for the permit once you had your ANR and stormwater permits in place. I may have been mistaken when I heard that. That was on a recent uh, conversation, but I know someone here might be able to answer that better than I could in terms of the timing of it. I thought that was the trade off. But I, I completely uh, agree with, with Mark in, in terms of um, making the, the permit process uh, understandable and easier to get to a certain point with conditions for those detailed permits later. Um, it's, it's true that, that a lot of people uh, involved in administration of Act 250 don't under, understand the cost implications of what it takes to file an Act 250 application, and especially all the engineering that's required. Uh, as a, as a uh, little backdrop story, uh, the Act 250 application until recently had something called a a risk check or a comp check analysis for energy conservation. And the comp check program, uh, I, I did quite a bit of research on this because I couldn't make it work. Uh, whether I lied to it, whether I told the truth, it could never prove that we were 10% better than, than the code. And, and yet I knew our, our project was 25% better. And so we worked and we worked and we worked. I thought, well, maybe I'm just an old guy. I don't really know how to run this program. And so I, I gave it to the millennials in the office and said, you do this. And they did it and came up with the same bad result. So I contacted the people that wrote the program in Oregon. And, and they wouldn't tell me how much the state of Vermont paid. They just said, the state of Vermont paid a lot of money to customize this program for its own particular use. And I, I, could, I, as I had the person who actually wrote the program on the phone with me. And I'm going through this and I'm pointing out to her how I'm putting in the data, but it's not coming out with the information that you would expect at the end. So it's really odd. It, it should work for you, but I can see I'm doing it here and it doesn't work. So well, many conversations later, I'm speaking to people in Montpelier and, um, and explaining to them that this doesn't work. And they said, well, other people seem to do it. So I called the Act 250 administrator and he said, well, I'll send you a copy of one. Well, I get this handwritten copy from this person. All these boxes were checked, handwritten, but there was no program. There was nothing spit out of the computer saying they complied. And the coordinator, so well, I got this piece of paper and they checked the boxes and so my box is checked because I got this piece of paper that said they comply. So there's an example of somebody complying with an ordinance that, uh, or, or a portion of the law that they actually weren't complying with. Uh, the coordinator accepted it because they signed a box saying we comply and, and I spent hours and hours and hours trying to get a building to comply. We eventually went to Efficiency Vermont. They ran it through a completely separate program demonstrated it was 25% better than code, the coordinator accepted that as proof that it was 10% better than code. So an example of maybe something that could be done differently. We've had that same experience about yeah. um, Brian, did you have a question? Yeah, um, Brian Schubert, my Natural Resources Council. Um, several panelists have mentioned the frustration with the appeals process, and that frustration isn't just limited to applicants, I'd say. And I'm wondering if um, each of the panelists could con contrast the current appeals process with the process under the Environmental Board and maybe identify what you consider the strengths and weaknesses of each of those. Um, I'll start. Um, housing Vermont has been through several appeals of our affordable housing projects, including the one Bob referred to in Woodstock, which took nine years to resolve, including going to the uh, um, state Supreme Court. Um, I, I think the, I was not a, uh, I was not a supporter of changing to the environmental court from the environmental board. I believe it has brought the appeals process to be much more, it's, and quite frankly, if I was a citizen, I think it'd be a lot harder to participate in the environmental court process. It gets lawyered up real fast. Um, I, I, I would be a supporter of returning to something like a, a three-member professional service board who would hear, now remember, the Environmental Court hears Act 250 appeals, state a &R permit appeals, and local zoning permit appeals. It's a wide range, and um, I think it's something that could be handled better by, uh, by a more, not, not full nine-member citizen board, but maybe a three-member citizen board, 
and I think it could serve both the applicant and the appellant in a, in a better fashion. My experience has been with the environmental court, and that's where my frustration has been. So I, I think if there's a way to, as, as Kathy alluded, to do some other means, the environmental court to me is not the best way to do it because it is to be very time consuming and doesn't seem to have any uh, any time limit at all. It's, it's at the pleasure of the judge who's reviewing the case. Um, I'm going to have to take a pass on that, Brian, because woohoo. I've had very little experience with appeals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question has to do with the alleged redundancy of the Act 250 program with the views done by A&R and with, uh, with the town's do. Uh, a little bit of a fact to it, I worked for the program, I think Ethan Allen was the chair of the environment. <laughs> <laughs> And in the 1990s, we did an effort to drill down into finding out well, how much development and subdivision of Vermont is actually subject to Act 250. In 1990, our best estimate was only 40% of all development and subdivision of Vermont goes through Act 250. My guess is it's a lot less now. My guess would be maybe 25, 30% of all development and subdivision go through Act 250. So the question is, are we really looking at the right forum here to evaluate improvements for the future? But here's my question about redundancy. People may be aware that Act 250 has always had a role uh, in being a fail-safe mechanism to see if the A&R technical permits were prominently issued. Um, and I look back and say, uh, in the very, very rare instances where the commission rebutted the presumption, it was for public benefit. I think of Hawk Mountain, I think of uh, Trap Family Lodge Incorporated with a unit discharge into the Waterbury Reservoir from a wastewater treatment plant. I think of the District 2 Commission, which rebutted stormwater permits down in Stratton Mountain. And there are other examples. Not a lot, but there are some. So first of two questions, is anyone aware of any analysis that has been done whether or not that was for the public benefit to the extent that now throwing that out and simply relying on A&R permits would be a loss for the public interest. And the second question is, uh, the quality of local reviews. Um, Title 24, Chapter 117 enables municipalities to do planning and adopt and implement zoning and subdivision bylaws. To my knowledge, there's never been uh, a quality check. There's been study after study of how is Act 250 doing, but I'm not aware of any objective analysis by either the legislature or anybody else as to the quality of the review of all those towns under that enabling legislation. So here, if we're about to say, let's reduce Act 250 jurisdiction, let's eliminate some of the criteria, uh, the serious concern is throwing the baby out with the bathwater because we really don't know uh, what we're gonna lose from that fail-safe mechanism looking at a &R permits, and secondly, what really is the quality of review of local review? So my question is, are you aware uh, of any reviews that have established the quality of local review uh, processes. And secondly, what do you think about the loss of that rebuttable presumption function by Act 250 commissions? Um, I think the loss of the rebuttable presumptions that is um, a function of changes of the times that have changed. Um, in the days when we um, saw Act 250 commissions challenging a &R permits. Um, those a &R permits were a lot less robust, I think, in terms of the engineering that went, had to go into them in some cases. Uh, there was fewer of them also. Um, and there was not the public process um, attached to them that there is nowadays. So I think that the um, the a and technical permits are now probably more sophisticated in terms of the engineering that goes into them, um, both from the applicant side and from the a and uh, review end of things. And I think there is also an associated public process that is somewhat duplicative. Um, so that's why I think that and our technical permits could be considered to be um, something that does not need to be rebuttable. 
um, within the Ad250 context. Um, and then uh, in terms of local review processes, I, I am, have not had a lot of experience with that um, in my own permitting life uh, because I live in a town or operate in a town uh, that does not have zoning. We only have subdivision regulations. Um, but from what I've seen on the, in my experience on the Regional Planning Commission, um, I think that you are correct. I think that there is some concern that local processes may not be as um, sophisticated um, and capable as the Act 250 process can be. Uh, but I don't think, but I think that is not universal. Um, for example, and, and perhaps David, you might want to chime in on this, um, in the city of Burlington, where you have a, 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 a robust planning effort, um, professional staff, um, sophisticated um, regulatory process, then the overlap with Act 250 may be a true redundancy. Um, so I think it, it's kind of a case-by-case -case type of thing. Thank you. I'm afraid we're going to have to end it right there. Thank you to our panelists, and thank you all for listening. second grade level. Um, so we're very lucky to have a group of outside perspectives, uh, folks who have been willing to come from other uh, parts of the country, um, who actually have a fair amount of knowledge about Vermont and Act 250, but uh, also have deep knowledge of, of their, their own jurisdictions and their own states. So um, to lead this discussion um, is the executive director of the Vermont Natural Resources Council. We're very lucky to have Brian Shoup um, and VNRC as sponsors of this event as longtime participants and supporters in the development of Act 250. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Brian to lead this conversation. Thank you. Thanks, David. No, I'll uh, just stay seated. Um, I'll be very brief in my introductory comments because most of them have already been made, several of them several times. Um, we've already established that Act 250 was a very visionary, groundbreaking law. It was um, appropriately technical. It was democratic. Um, it was incomplete in some respects with the absence of a land use plan. Uh, as Diane Snelling mentioned, it has been amended several times over the years. Arguably, I would argue that many of those amendments have not been improved with Act 250. Um, and we also have established that things have changed uh, significantly. The, the role of um, state government in regulating environmental um, resources has expanded tremendously. The sophistication of municipal planning and land use regulation has grown in some communities, some parts of the state. Um, and the whole um, fields of growth management, land use regulation, and, and environmental regulation um, have, have evolved quite a bit. So this is an appropriate time to take a hard look at Act 250 to see where 
it, what its role should be moving forward in the future. And we are very fortunate to have some folks here from outside of Vermont who can maybe give us some advice and um, point us in the right direction in, in a couple of areas. So I'm not going to read their um, bios. They're very um, impressive. They're included in your, your meeting packet, but I'll just give a little bit of a brief introduction. Um, to my immediate left is uh, Drew Schmidt Perkins, who has a long history with the Thousand Friends of Maryland and um, is the uh, Vice Chair of Smart Growth America and is really one of uh, the country's leading experts in smart growth and land use planning um, and the relationship between land use and transportation and environmental protection. Um, we also have to her left, Rob Sanford, who was a district coordinator for nine years in Vermont in District 3, um, and then went on to um, uh, become the chair of the um, Department of Environmental Science and Policy at the University of Southern Maine, where he teaches a variety of, of environmental policy and, and planning um, um, classes and issues. And then to his left is Josh Brower, who uh, early in his career was hired by Peg Elmer as an intern at the Agency of Natural Resources and then actually helped staff the Castle Commission that came up with um, Act 200 in the late 1980s. Uh, Josh went on to move out to Washington State where he uh, uh, got a law degree and practiced land use and environmental law and chaired the Seattle Planning Commission for several years. So I'm really glad that they have this both inside and outside perspective that they can bring to bear. Um, I'm going to ask them uh, each the same question uh, to, to maybe help us give us perspective from what other jurisdictions in the country are doing. Uh, the first one, we've talked a lot about planning today, um, the relationship of planning to Act 50, the relationship of local planning, regional planning. Um, to state planning and, and how that should fit into our, uh, our environmental protection laws and our community development laws. So in Vermont, as most folks in this room know, Act 250 from its inception created a strong role for municipalities and regional planning commissions to exercise a lot of, of influence over how development should occur in, their, in, their, in the municipality and in the region. We have criteria 10, we have criteria 6, we have criteria 7, we have the sub-criterion, several of the sub-criteria under 9, all relate to some variation of, of growth management, land use planning, and community development, and local decision making, and regional decision making. So I'm going to ask um, our panelists, um, in their states and in, in places where they have experience, um, what is that relationship between local, regional, and state level land use planning and development regulation? whether the tension exists in their jurisdictions between the desire for local control um, and the uh, responsibility of the state government to uh, manage statewide resources or to address development projects that might have impacts beyond municipal jurisdictions. And I think I'm going to start with Rob. Um, Oh, big mistake. Start with the professor. <laughs> I'm a tenured full professor with a low budget and no ambition, so I might just answer this just how I want. <laughs> but uh, first of all, I apologize if you have any 1B waste disposal issues because I wrote some of the permits for the Vermont Law School, and perhaps we should have retained jurisdiction. Um, I'd like to tell you a couple of trends that we have ongoing in Maine. First of all, we started out great guns. We had a Smart Growth Institute in the year 2000. We had Governor Glenn Denning from Maryland come up. And we started out going, and then we sort of lost our way. So we dismantled our state planning office. Uh, if you realize, state planning offices do two functions. One is they do research, and the second function they have is advocacy. And many governors don't realize that they can just direct that state planning office to do research for them. And some states do a combination of them. So we kind of outsource that uh, among different state agencies and drop some of that. The trends that we're having, it, not all towns have planning and, and zoning. The state planning office would offer incentives to develop comprehensive plans. Now they offer it as advice, but before the incentive could be financial, so that if you had comprehensive plans, there could be money implied similar to where you have in Act 250, if you've got planning and zoning, you know, you've got 
a higher levels for that. So our regional commissions act more advisory and because I work in education, I often find that many of our students who are here to study planning and policy don't know that we have regional planning commissions or what they do. So we make them go out and intern in them. Uh, we have, Maine has, it's one of the grayest states in the nation to which I am contributing, although I'm shifting to white from gray. And we also have um, one of the lowest growth rates, although I just became a grandpa on Friday, so. Congratulations. <laughs> which is interesting because the outside perspective, I started here, my first job in grad school was working here. And so we kind of set that. We are wrestling with other similar things, the high cost of housing in coastal areas. We have low unemployment, but we also have significantly low wages. My daughter took a job in Virginia that paid $25,000 more than any comparable job in Maine. Um, Northern Maine, we, we have, it's more conservative, so we have the two Maines, like you have the two Vermonts. 60% um, of the economy in the state of Maine is, is in Cumberland County and the greater Portland area. So there's that perception that those folks are driving and dominating and yet most of the folks are elsewhere. Uh, we have high high school graduation, but we have low college. Part of that is we have Ivy League, so we figure let the folks from Boston come up and get their fancy education and we'll go out and make money in the forest and um, agriculture industry, but those industries have dried up and the dominant industry in Maine is tourism. And like Maine, I mean like Vermont, we are recognizing that the green environment is part of the tourism and the concept of the working landscape. So that's kind of the Vermont uh, and Maine parallels that we have. But for all of you out there with your smartphones and taking notes, now I want you to shift that from checking your email to taking notes. I want you to write down three perceptions of Vermont that you think Maine has. And uh, you'll get, um, I've been authorized to give you three continuing legal education points for every one you get correct. Okay, so begin, because I'm gonna read off mine soon and we'll see how quick you match, okay? Just one or two word perceptions of Vermont that we have in Maine. One way shift, you don't get that citizen involvement back very easily. Okay, number three, on my, and these aren't in any particular order, but uh, historic. We in Maine think, uh, now we think we're darn historic too, but we think you also are historic. Uh, number four, Small scale. There aren't many states where you can have a statewide conversation. And um, it's, it's geographically difficult because it can take eight hours to go across Maine. Okay, uh, number five, no offense, but we think you're kind of liberal. <laughs> okay, you want to know that? All right, all right. So, and um, my sixth one, uh, this. Vermont is your reward, our reward, for driving through New Hampshire. <laughs> no, Vermont abandoned its uh, Office of State Planning about 10 years before May did, so we're way ahead of you guys. <laughs> That's why I left. Uh, Drew? Good morning. It's really fun to be here, and the only way I can connect to Vermont is I got cousins who live here. So does that count? Um, but I never worked here. Um, so I asked the same question of a number of people. When you think of Vermont, what do you think? Sorry guys, maple syrup was number one. <laughs> Two was beautiful. Three was cute little towns. Um, and I can't remember what the last one was now. But. Um, <coughs> I think that that does go to how successful you all have been with your citizen involvement, with your Act 250, and I'll come back to that name, um, and the hard work that you've been doing here. So Maryland is a little different from <laughs> uh, Vermont. We have over 600, 6 million people, and in the last year, it got 24,000 more. 
The town I live in, Baltimore City, has as many citizens as Vermont. Um, our population is struggling there, too. Um, we have 23 counties and 157 municipalities. We have one city who has no county, so it's a city county, that's Baltimore. Um, and the power of our land use planning is very much at the county level and where the cities have planning, most of them do there too. Um, and Maryland Association of Counties runs the state. We call it, it's called MAKO, it's also known as Make No. Um, <laughs> they say no to everything. Any attempt to do everything is one size doesn't fit all. Uh, so no statewide planning, no statewide standards. Um, and no, we're not going to do that. Now, we've had some success working with them, but they also fuel the flame of the two Maryland, Marylands, like you all have, and it got converted by um, the conservative, by the Republican, um, angry, anti-everything community as a war on rural Maryland. Um, anything that we were trying to do to protect the environment, to strengthen workplace laws, to do anything was a war on rural Maryland. And it really hurt the kind of conversation that we needed to have in Maryland. Um, and um, to be constantly accused when you're trying to actually work on things that would strengthen the economic engines of rural Maryland, um, to be accused of trying to um, fight them has, has been hard. The word we can never use in Maryland is regionalism. That's been banned virtually. Don't ever use it um, because of this um, strong local jurisdiction, local counties. Uh, the counties get to say, if they're not playing well with their neighboring counties, so be it. So we have counties that have planned their land preservation areas just beautifully and done the hard work and right next door, right over the line, this imaginary legal line, is this the worst sloppily, poorly planned, high polluting, expensive to maintain development, which of course all those people drive through the rural you know, preserved lands and the hard work that's been done at other places. So we are working on that issue and trying to figure out how do we unify. Um, we have um, very strong local planning laws. Our company hands of plan laws are very strong. A lot of requirements, they have to now update them every 10 years, it used to be six. Nobody did them at six years, there was no accountability to actually do them. So we said, okay, 10 years, and this time we mean it, they have to be updated regularly. Those comprehensive plan laws do have to be linked and followed. It is actually, you're required, our comprehensive plans are laws, and this comes to this name. Um, when we call something a plan, people think it doesn't, it's just a plan, you know? I had a plan to work out this morning. <laughs> <laughs> a plan includes action steps. <laughs> So when we so the names mean something, right? Um, and so you know, this is one of my sort of things is to say, well, why are we calling plants? We need to have something that sounds a little bit more formal. Um, but they are required then to have zoning and all the regulatories meet those plan goals. Because all our comprehensive plans say we want everything to be beautiful and functional and lovely, and and then we zone for two acre development and all sorts of other problems. But in Maryland, it is supposed to be aligned. We also are required to have a state plan. For 40 years, it's involved a stapler. We've taken the 23 local plans and we staple them together. <laughs> <clears throat> Under O'Malley, that changed. Governor O'Malley. Um, Governor Glendening is, of course, a great smart growth uh, governor. You all have heard of him. Um, and I, I, you know, to the name bit, he said, what are we calling it, growth management? Let's call it smart growth, because automatically our opponents are then for what? Dumb growth. Um, <laughs> so names matter. I mean, I, you know, the, hearing you all talk about Act 200, Act 
to 50. You need nicknames. Right? <laughs> With criteria number nine, it means something to you all. However, you know, to involve more people, please, nicknames. We've talked about a mascot. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> On it, okay. Um, That'd be the permit thrush. <laughs> <laughs> So under Glenn Denning, he elevated our planning agency to a state department and gave it real teeth. Uh, Governor O'Malley maintained that and made them provide incredible information and run roughshod over other agencies to do the right thing. Then comes Governor Hogan, who is dismantling that agency by firing everybody good, putting in anti-planning people, and not, <clears throat> I haven't found anything they've done, actually, at all. So we are struggling now with, you know, a number of years of really aggressive work to improve our planning, and now have a governor who um, does not want that so, so much. We're hoping that the sort of the stuff we have in the works and diving to the local level, we can protect more of this work. Um, but if we have a second term of Governor Hogan, it's going to be um, much harder to do that. Um, I think I'll leave it with that. Um, that um, I agree that um, we need to make sure that we have. Have a, have a process that's very um, citizen friendly, that has excellent enforcement, um, easier appeal process, um, that, that is very citizen involved. We can't give that part up in this process. Maryland has a very, very poor citizen <coughs> appeal process, and that's hurting us. So I would be very interested to see how Vermont moves forward to simplify that, make that better and stronger. Thanks, Drew Drum. Good morning and thank you for inviting me home. Uh, I grew up in Plainfield, Vermont, went to Twinfield, and then went to U32 for high school. Uh, I know I'm a Vermonter because as the old adage goes, I plan on being buried here. Uh, I will tell you that I moved to Washington State about 28 years ago, planning to live there for one year, and then come back here, go to law school on the East Coast, and come back to Vermont and work, and I fell in love when I went to Washington, um, both with the state and my wife. Uh, and it's a great place to live. I can, two things happen when I tell people I'm from Vermont. Either they tell me that it's the most beautiful place they've ever been, and they wonder how it's remained so beautiful, or they say, what is Vermont? I literally had somebody say to me, is that a town in New York State? <laughs> no, it's actually a state. Uh, I'm a land use planner by training, and I I uh, did intern with the Agency of Natural Resources. I was assistant to the state's land use attorney, so I actually helped process and write ANR permits on a weekly basis, and also defended the state's ANR decisions in front of the then growth board here in uh, I was also asked to be a staff member on uh, Governor Cunin's Growth Management Commission working with Doug Costle, which was a true honor and really an eye-opening uh, experience. One of the things I was asked to do when I was working with the Growth Management Commission was to study Vermont and Oregon's land use policies and provide that information to the commission as a model roadmap of what would be a good system for how to do land use regulation and planning in a state and on a statewide basis. And I did that. I actually wrote my honors thesis in college on that analysis. What I can tell you that's going on in Washington State is the worst possible combination that I could ever imagine as a land use planner and as a land use lawyer. Washington adopted its version of SEPA, which is a baby NEPA, State Environmental Policy Act, about the same time that Vermont adopted Act 250. SEPA is about 46 years old. And SEPA, like Act 250, requires that you fill out a checklist and you prove up some points used to be an easy form to fill out, now it can stretch for hundreds if not thousands of pages with the technical reports that you have to prepare and submit along with it. Uh, and SEPA is done both at the local level, at the county level, and at the state level. Washington State is pretty unique. It's a huge state by comparison to Vermont. Since I moved there, over two million people have moved to Washington State. 
Uh, Seattle has more people than the entire state of Vermont has in it. And as you probably all heard, we have a little company called Amazon.com that has developed an office campus in downtown Seattle. Over the last four years, Amazon has brought 40,000 new jobs to downtown Seattle. So that's like taking a Burlington and putting another Burlington in downtown Burlington. So you can imagine the land use issues, the growth issues, the housing cost issues that have come along with it. What Washington State does is it has a state government, uh, and the state has agencies like the Agency of Natural Resources, all of which is called the Department of Ecology. Um, but it also has very strong county governments, unlike Vermont. And so every county has very robust, fully staffed county government. Uh, then you have municipalities, and every municipality has its own municipal code. So you've got three layers at a minimum of regulatory action and jurisdiction in the state of Washington. Most of the action happens at the local level, at the city level or the town level. Um, in my uh, work as a land use lawyer, it's pretty rare that I ever get a county permit because the county jurisdiction is only under, covers unincorporated areas of the state. So if you're within a municipal area that's incorporated, you're going in front of the local town body first. Uh, and it's also pretty rare that I have to get a statewide permit. The state doesn't do a lot of land use permitting. They handle a lot of the uh, environmental work, uh, shorelines, uh, stormwater, things of that nature. We also, in 1990, passed a Growth Management Act, which was this idea that, like Vermont is having this conversation now, you have this kind of Act 250-esque piece of legislation that was chugging along for about 20-something years, was kind of doing its job. There was a perception that most projects get through. There was a perception that maybe only a certain percentage, like Ed said, are even covered by SEPA. And you had rampant sprawl going on in Washington because right outside the municipal areas, you have all this beautiful land that's forest or old farms, uh, resource lands. So there was this huge pressure to start developing outside of Seattle. When I moved to Seattle, there was a little town called Issaquah. It was sleepy. It looked maybe like Barrie, maybe smaller than Barrie. Um, now it's a couple hundred thousand people live out there. And they've got these huge, sprawling mega developments that have their own little quasi-town centers, uh, strip malls in them. So what you see in Washington is we put this big pressure on planning with this idea that we're going to have statewide planning goals that will get transmitted down to the county as planning goals. So that State goals, you have county goals, and county plans have to be written that are consistent with the state goals. And then below that, you have municipal plans that have to be done that have to be consistent with the county goals and the state goals. So we spent a ton of time writing comprehensive plans. Um, I, when I was on the Planning Commission in Seattle, I worked on the update to Seattle's plan. And in Washington, they're supposed to be updated every five years. But the state will kick that can down the road because the state has to fund a lot of the local governments to do their planning. So if the state didn't have any money, they said, okay, we'll give you a little bit more time. Uh, in Seattle, the comprehensive plan is a pretty huge document. And within it, in Seattle, there's 38 neighborhoods. And in the 90s, when we were first doing planning, the neighborhoods got together and said, well, we want to write our own neighborhood plans. And but only 28 out of the 38 neighborhoods did it. And each neighborhood, depending on the sophistication and how much money they had, could they, do they have some architects or some landscape architects or some engineers or lawyers who live there who might volunteer. So some neighborhood plans were very robust, others were very thin. Uh, the city then took those 28 neighborhood plans, stapled them into the comprehensive plan for the city. And then here's the best thing we do with it. We take all this amazing work and we put it on a shelf and we forget about it and walk away from it. Even though the state law says that development regulations have to be consistent with your local plan, whether that's your city plan, your county plan, your state plan, once those development regulations are updated if your plan has changed, when somebody walks in for a permit and says, well, the plan says I can do this here and it's consistent with the zoning, the state says, great, where is your SEPA permit? Starts back at Act 250, essentially and then says, well, did you get this other permit? You might need a statewide permit for this. You might need a local permit for that. You might need a county permit for that. And so the entire permitting process starts again. 
in Seattle to get a permit to build a multi-story, 10 or 12 story mixed use building that's gonna have commercial on the ground floor and maybe housing above. It can take two to three years to get that permit. In Oregon, where Oregon puts all of its emphasis on planning, Oregon spends a ton of time, they put all their brain power into planning, and then their planning has teeth, and then they say, okay, we're gonna take our plan, and if you wanna do something, you have to look at the plan and prove that you're consistent with it and you're doing it in the right place. If you walk in in Portland to get a permit to build that same 10 to 12 story building, in all of Portland except for one neighborhood, which is getting redeveloped and it's a hot neighborhood, it takes three months to get the permit, but in Seattle it takes three years. In the Pearl District in Portland, it takes six months because there's a secondary level of review. So when I think about Vermont, the, the struggle to make a clear corollary is that you don't have county governments here, and you've got town governments that are staffed by largely by volunteers. My dad still lives in Middlesex with my stepmom. Um, and so you also ran out of planning, and that was really kind of the root part of Act 250, was it was supposed to be married to a very strong planning for the whole state. And so for me, without good planning, it's hard to have a good and efficient and predictable permitting process because I largely see, and I see this in Washington all the time, we as a society kick the can down the road of hard land use decisions. Instead of doing hard planning to say, this is what we want where, and this is what we don't want over there because we want to preserve this area, we say, well, we'll just let the people fight it out through the permitting process, which then brings everybody into it. In Seattle, we have a phrase, it's called the Seattle process. We love process in Seattle. Uh, I think the city literally has 130 something volunteer commissions on everything. Um, the planning commission is one of those. Uh, I had to apply to get on the planning commission. There were 50 people who applied for the spot that I applied for, and I was appointed by the mayor. The mayor made me come in and interview with him for half an hour. And I was thinking to myself, don't you have something better to do? Not to say that, but it was great. Um, so we love our process. But the, what the process does, it allows, it, it adds time and cost to projects. Um, I've been working on a piece of uh, land use litigation that I started working on the project when my daughter was three. Uh, and I just took her to go look at Bates College in Maine where she'll be matriculating as a freshman in September. So I've been working on this one project for 15 years. And I'm the lead lawyer. We filed the lawsuit on the project in 2008. I've been to trial four times. I've been to the appellate court three times. And we're slated to go back to court, I just got the email yesterday, on November 9th for our fourth appeal. There's no end in sight. And so this is, and it's just a little project in Seattle. Um, and, you know, we've argued it's inconsistent with the comprehensive plan, and the city goes, well, we don't really care. Um, they got the permit, we think we can get a permit for it. So, when I think about Vermont, I think about, you know, it's hard, it's a very rural state, um, with not a ton of resources, but to me, planning is where the rubber meets the road. So, as a follow-up to that, I guess, who, who's doing it right? What examples do you guys have of either in your states of some really creative or innovative solutions to some of the challenges that you've heard about today. Uh, I'll go back perhaps to you to start with that. Well, let's define getting it right. This administration or the previous one? It's not the okay. previous one. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, we're on full-scale defense of the things that I think that we are doing, moving things forward. Um, Maryland um, is cut in half by the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, so 21% of our state is actually water. Just, I was on Wikipedia. Um, you're 4%, just for contrast. That is um, one um, a land use challenge because how many bridges do we want to build across the bay um, so that people can get to the beach on the Atlantic side. But it's also an incredible environmental issue. And Maryland recognized years ago, decades ago, that land use has an effect on the Chesapeake Bay. 
um, and has focused a lot of our land use policy around saving the bay. Um, so some of the things that I think that we're doing well um, is, you know, first we said, okay, let's start preserving land better. So we said, every time you sell a piece of property, one half or one percent of that, um, twice of that property has to go into a fund to preserve land, program open space. It of course got to diverted to everything other than saving program land, but then we passed a law, not once, but twice, get a theme in your own, um, that says, no, 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 really, really, this is a dedicated fund for this purpose, and now we're actually getting some of the stolen funds back. So one, we set up that for, for land use. Two, um, we said, well, okay, let's protect the ribbon of land around the Chesapeake Bay from development, and said, you know, within a thousand feet of the shore, very limited development, except, except, except. Um, and then recognize that, hmm, that's not actually doing much of everything else is being paved over. Um, and so move from those critical areas, as that was called, to identifying more land use changes. I think um, that one of the most innovative solutions that we have come up with involves septic systems. And I have ended up being this weird specialist in septics. And I relish um, the fight. Um, <laughs> Marilyn said low cost sprawling development is happening because it is low cost. And we've got to recognize that. Um, and all our land use laws do not enough compete with cheaper development out there. So we have to start looking at what's driving it. One of the things that's driving it, it's cheaper to hook up to a septic system, $10,000 put in the ground, than $30,000 to hook it up, a uh, house up to a water and sewer. So let's make it harder to do septics. And we passed the infamous tier map, which says to every county, tell us where your water and sewer is, where it's going next. So tier one's where it is, tier two where it's going next. Tier three is low density, schlocky, poorly planned development on septics. And tier four is the areas you have designated for rural. And in the rural areas, you're no longer allowed to do major subdivisions on septics. Mm -hmm. And so they changed the definition locally of what a major subdivision is, um, <laughs> which had been four units or more, and they went to seven units or more. We caught them in the act and squashed from them. Um, but that has um, begun to do a couple things. One, um, it has actually had real impact on um, rural development. Um, and two, it began to link the impact of the individual house on the, the environment. And when you couple that with um, our stormwater utility fee passed the same year um, that says the more impervious surface you have, the more you pay in a fee to pay for programs to reduce stormwater. Um, we've begun to sort of look at development issues and the environment. Of course, our current governor ran and won on fighting the rain tax. Um, as he dubbed our stormwater fee. So, um, it, it, you know, these two things I think have, have been um, exciting. Um, and I, I do have to just put it in another context. Because we have the Chesapeake Bay, we are also under federal pollution limits. Um, and we have total maximum daily load limits of pollution uh, for the bay. Bay's in trouble. And so a lot of these things we're able to, to do against meeting those goals. But we, of course, any minute expect those goals to disappear um, because of Washington. So, we, you know, that's an additional challenge we have in Maryland, but it's, it's a challenge that we're trying to really work on um, and, and maximize in ways that, that help with both land use and um, directly with, with um, water quality. Thanks, Drew. And just an, an aside, when a, um, a group of us met with the Vermont uh, Senate President Pro Tem to talk about funding mechanisms for our water cleanup for Lake Champlain. He played us a uh, 
rain tax commercial that your governor ran on this phone. Um, we, we have, a, I'll, I'll give you our commercial. <laughs> uh, no, we have a really that. good one. Yeah. Rob, so when you teach environmental policy, what are the what are the good examples that you point to of, of communities or, or states, um, jurisdictions that are doing it well? Well, first I want to say that rain tax, that's a good example of naming that you were talking about. I mean, yeah. that, it also sounds like an Art Garfunkel song. But, but, um, <laughs> Here's a couple things that Maine has done right. Very early on, we made our counties watershed based. If you think about that, that's phenomenal because you can regulate based upon an actual environmental logic of watershed. Uh, the second thing we did was early on, we started looking at the question of sprawl and we recognized the triangle of comprehensive plan, zoning and subdivision putting those three things into sync together, and that's through our state planning office and through, look, and through using the regional planning commissions, which I say are largely advisory. The, the uh, third thing we are doing is conversation about drivers. You need to be talking about drivers. Uh, for example, climate. Now, we environmental scientists don't even talk about climate change because it's, we consider it a natural aspect of climate so that mentioning it is just mentioning one particular thing. The first response to climate change, and I'm speaking as an environmental scientist, is insects. And the second response is disease brought by insects because low order species can move fast, reproduce fast, so you're going to see woolly adalgid and all these other things coming. So that second response of disease, malaria, will start working its way up. And the third response is going to be habitat um, ecological change as a result of that, that cascading effect. And the fourth response is going to be institutional response. And institutional response is largely going to be too late and after the fact. So we are already seeing change. Opossum kills are increasing in Maine. Now, the opossum, aside from Pogo, is not a political animal. So, it, but they're just appearing more. They're a southern animal. But, and so that's an example of one driver. The second one is the shift to the service economy, which may have, like I say, parallels to Vermont. Continued recognition of the role of environment in environmental settings in the state economy. Um, decrease in regional authority due to decrease in regional resources, but the need for local planning. For example, how many of you realize that in, when Katrina hit, the Army Corps had filed a set of responses, well-developed plans, and that were sitting there, and an engineer had written them, but, but the, um, the parishes elected to spend that planning money in building bridges to floating casinos. And so there's an example of plans are not just abstract things, they're about taking action. And some of the other drivers are the increased need for federal, state, and local coordination. So Maine is working on that. We have an EPA Environmental Finance Center grant for that. We have an Institute for Climate Studies at, at Orno that's doing that. So there are a few things that Maine is doing that we can look forward to. And one of the things I'd like to encourage all of you here is to think about this as having some kind of smart growth institute or some kind of thing where you gather together periodically to do this. And so that we don't just talk about ideas, but we set forth some plans. Josh, you cited Oregon a couple times as being a, 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 a good example. What is it about that that, that you know, what aspects of their planning program or their, their land use and development regulation system you, you, you find good? I think the proof's in the pudding. And I think it also is reflected in Washington State as well. Uh, when you go to Oregon, most of their sprawl is contained. Uh, their communities are pretty compact. And they've done a good job of preserving their natural resource areas, whether it's ag land or forestry or mineral resources. Um, as we were flying out yesterday, it was a beautiful day in Seattle, and you could see for forever the mountains were out, and what really struck me was you could almost physically see the urban growth boundary on the ground as you take off and you head east out of Seattle because you move from a very dense uh, populated area in Seattle to slightly less dense areas you move east, and then when you get out to Issaquah and the foothills of the Cascade Mountains, pretty much all the urban sprawl stops right there. 
And what you see are a couple holdover communities that were um, these large scale subdivisions that kind of slipped through and said, you know, we'll go on your municipal sewer, we'll go on your municipal water, uh, and we'll do these big contained communities that were outside the growth boundaries. We haven't seen one of those come through in the last 15 or so years in Washington State. And so what I think is working well is the work that was done in planning. And one of the main things that both Oregon and Washington do is they draw up urban growth boundaries. And they say that in this area, we're gonna have density, and this is where the municipal services are, this is where sewer water is. Um, and outside those boundaries, we're gonna have rural development. I will tell you that in Washington State, they think rural is a five acre horse lot. Um, where I grew up, it means a compact town center with beautiful open space surrounding it, so I think it's a little bit backwards in Washington, but at least that's their idea, is that you have to have at least a five acre lot. You can't have one acre lots, because that's just kind of the spaghetti lots that were created under Act 250 um, long ago. So I think that's what's working well, is good planning that has good boundaries, um, and you don't push those boundaries, and you don't move them all the time. Okay. Um, so we've got about another 10 or 15 minutes. I do want to let the audience have an opportunity to answer questions. I guess so I just ask one more. You've listened to this morning's talks. You, you have some experience with Act 250 in Vermont and planning. You have a, a good perspective from your work outside of the state. Kind of in a nutshell, as briefly as possible, what, what advice do you have for Amy and the Act 250 Commission and everybody here moving forward as we re-envision Act 250 for the next 50 years? Um, and I'll start with you, Josh. Well, I think it's a hard choice that Vermont has to ask itself. And to me, it goes back to the genesis of Act 250 and the fact that only half of it really got enacted that the land use plan for the state was pushed aside because it's hard to make those decisions on where you draw the lines because you're either inside that line or outside that line. And there are real economic benefits to being on either side of them perceived or real depending on it. So without good planning, I think Vermont's gonna just keep kicking the can down the road of making land use decisions through litigation. I'm reminded about something Doug Costell said, and it took me a while to figure it out because I was 22 years old, uh, and it didn't make much sense to me, but it did as I got older. Um, Doug Hostel said, there's powerful logic in the status quo. And I think Vermont right here and right now, you guys are struggling with, do we make some tweaks to Act 250? And, you know, go a little bit forward, go a little bit backwards, but it'll essentially keep the status quo of just doing land use policy through incremental permitting and litigation, or does the state really make the hard decision to do planning with keys to it. Rob? Okay, so the one thing I want to leave you with is this notion of creative tension. And um, there's a certain thing when you get too much stimuli, like you, uh, what I call the Walmart effect, you go in there and you can't find anything, there's too much and you just want to get out of there. And um, on the other hand, if there's not enough stimulus, you fall asleep. So you need something in between. So tension, a certain amount of tension is a good thing. And um, so in fact, there's a whole theory called creative tension. And that's where you use adversarial things to tease out the answer. Not everything, uh, things that are collaborative often come out from people from different positions. So the number one thing is to have a conversation, recognize that there are these tensions, like the two names, the two Vermonts, plans versus actions, planning versus zoning, ideal versus permittable, local versus state, visionary versus practical, strategic versus tactical, historical versus future, you get the idea. But think about those as tools that you can put together and use to solve problems. As soon as you stop having the conversation, you stop solving the problem, and that's why the citizen involvement is so powerful. Great, thanks. Drew? I'm going to pick up on the citizen involvement. We often we see this um, is feared. Um, it can be shortchanged. Um, in Maryland, there's a big fear of um, lawsuits willy nilly. If we give people standing, the right to sue, citizen standing in Maryland virtually doesn't exist. And what happens instead when people are not fully engaged and have the opportunity? all the way through and understand the process and know that people have their back and that it's fair, then people step away, people stop working on the, the hard projects and that, that never wins. So 
um, continue to build this robust citizen involvement straight through the process, while at the same time, and here's the challenge, keeping it simple and fast. I mean, everybody deserves to have things resolved in a reasonable amount of time. It's not okay to raise an entire child and maybe even fund their education on a single project. I mean, Funding is okay. <laughs> Are, are, are simply not okay. And I love the example earlier about how a project had to do, had to be shortchanged because of legal fees. I mean, those are real, real aspects. So make it the process clear. Make the citizen involvement robust and real. Have real authority. Have people have the ability to challenge. Have these timelines be um, be tight. Um, and Think about the language. Um, uh, what you all are doing here is stunning, amazing. The results are in incredible. Um, having driven up yesterday from Maryland through New Jersey, New York, I bet up here and I was laughing last night and I said, so what's the problem? <laughs> I mean, you know, really, I mean, and it's hidden. You guys got a lot of trees. But um, it, it, this is a stunning place, and you've done amazing things. But you, you, I think you need to work on the communication. <laughs> this, this is a little bit hard for people to, to get into and understand what, what some of these things are. So nicknames are good um, for, when you use them for the good. Um, and um, finally, um, I, I think it is look for the weird solution. When I started working on land use um, issues, I never really thought that I'd find the solution through septic system policy. But we were forced to sort of go to a different direction and look for what was the driver, what was the unusual thing, how could we come at stuff from another point of view um, and, 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 and another strange reason to, to get the outcome that we wanted. So look for those opportunities. Thanks. I want to make sure we have a chance for anybody to ask questions. Matt? So Josh, I have a question about Oregon. About 10 years ago, the NRC brought in a, did a whole day program on Oregon. A couple of years ago, I went online and I looked on Google Earth at the forest in Oregon. And it looked like it was almost like strip farming. And so what my question is, is has this successful effort to concentrate growth and make permitting more efficient in the growth center area actually resulted in better environmental protection? Or is it just now a resource extraction? It's a really good question. And, and what I've come to learn in living in the West is that your view of environmental protection is very parochial. Um, I actually had somebody say to me that Washington's hydroelectric dams are not green power because they're big dams. They're not running the river dams like we have in Vermont. And because these big dams have stopped salmon migration, they're actually bad for the environment. Whereas I would argue that when you make power from water, that's actually green. So the reason that uh, timber harvesting looks like strip mining is that the West was carved up into sections of land, which is a full section, which was the survey grid. And one section was given to the railroad company, and one section was allowed to be uh, homesteaded through state claims by settlers moving out there. And the federal government did that. It's a checkerboard in the West. And they did that to encourage the building of the transcontinental railroads. Well, the railroads then sold that land to timber companies. And so they, can, they literally survey a straight line and they'll come in and they will cut down every tree on the left of the line and on the right of the line there'll be trees. So it looks like they're being strip mined. In the West they call that environmental management and resource management because they'll look, then come in and replant them and somewhere between 10 and 20 years later all those trees will be grown back up. Um, I, I'm an avid skier still and I'm now looking at I think the second or third clear cutting of this same parcel that I've been watching for 20 something years as I drive by it. It was literally strip mined and then grew back up 
and then was cut again. I would argue that those protections are working because what they've done is they've said, here's where we're going to do that stuff, and here's where we're not going to do that stuff. Um, I would also argue that one of the reasons that the timber industry left the West is largely the spotted owl, the cost, the environmental permitting, and then the shift in the economy. So, you know, some of it's the permitting, some of it's just evolution of our economy. Any other questions? We can all smell lunch. Yeah. <laughs> so with none, I, um, uh, as far as lunch, I'll make a couple of announcements. I should have said earlier, well, first I want to thank the panelists for coming here and for sharing the <laughs> Um So this afternoon we're going to be breaking into breakout groups. There's a number of panels in the back of the room. Uh, those that are self-explanatory, those are the issues. They describe the issues that we're going to be discussing in the afternoon, and they provide an opportunity for all of you to provide some input on what your, your um, kind of feedback on those issues and the thoughts that you might have that will be shared with the commission going forward. We are going to summarize today's proceedings, including these afternoon breakout groups. So we are going to have lunch. Uh, there's going to be two buffet lines lining up there, which we can uh, make our way to, I think, right now. It smells like the food's there. So on either side of the either side of the coffee, there will be a buffet line. And then in about 20, 25 minutes or so, um, after we get settled, while we're still eating, we're going to introduce our keynote speaker, um, John Adams. So is that right, Pat? And we're going to do the tables table by table. We're going to we're going to sending them off. Okay, we're going to do we're going to do table by table. And not everybody rush up. So why don't we why don't we start with the back of the room, um, maybe the back four tables to come on up and, and help yourself to lunch. Thanks everyone. Um, I want to call our uh, Dean uh, Tom McHenry to the microphone. If I can tear him away from John Kessler. Two people who have a visiting problem. When I, when I was in second grade, I told someone this story a moment ago. I, uh, I had Mrs. 50 for my teacher. And my mother showed up one day to, to class and, and found me sitting in the corner, separated from all of the other students in the class. And my mother said, why is David sitting in the corner? And Mrs. 50 said, he has a visiting problem. <laughs> so I introduce uh, Tom McHenry, who has a visiting problem. Um, but we are, we're very blessed to have Tom McHenry, who is someone who has um, many decades of experience as an environmental lawyer out in California, um, but who also has deep connections um, to this state and to this region. Um, and he has brought his skill set and his experience to here at Vermont Law School. And uh, uh, Tom will uh, share some short remarks, and then we'll introduce our, our next speaker. Thank you. David, thank you very much. And the best news of all is my remarks will be really short. But Thank you, David. Uh, just an amazing group of people here. I've only had a chance to meet a few of you, but uh, I think you'll probably be able to complete the revisions to Act 250 before you finish your dessert. Um, it's just a, it's an, and it's extraordinary group uh, and an extraordinary amount of expertise. Um, I uh, first want to uh, see how many people in the room are graduates of Vermont Law School. So if you are, please raise your hand, including David Mears up here. So. Okay. Uh, for faculty of Vermont Law School, I see one of them checking his uh, iPhone while I'm speaking. Professor Shabria, can you raise your hand? <laughs> Professor Shabria is not hearing me. Can you raise your hand, John? Uh, anybody else from uh, faculty of Vermont Law School with us? Um, and uh, anybody who has employed as an extern or as an employee a student from Vermont Law School? Ah, there we go. Okay. We want you to please continue to do that. We have an extraordinary group of young people and older people uh, at the school, very interested in environmental issues, very interested in land use issues, and particularly as the subject of climate change has forced us all to think about the ways that land use and energy tie to environmental quality. Um, our students are very interested in working with you, so look for that opportunity. At dinner last night, uh, Eli from our Career Services Office, when we went around and introduced ourselves, said, that he uh, was here and he was looking for a job. He wasn't planning to leave us, but he was looking for a job for the students from our school. So we'd really like to encourage that. 
Um, I had the opportunity uh, in uh, California a number of years ago as an environmental lawyer to look at a unified environmental statute, and we got together and spent an entire year figuring out how we would rewrite California's environmental laws, which are about almost the same size as the entire set of federal environmental laws. And I will let you know it was a complete and total failure. Um, so I admire the effort to look at Act 250. Uh, if there was any lesson I learned from that process, it was that it takes uh, a lot of time and effort and an immense amount of flexibility from a lot of entrenched interests. And I think one of the things we're exploring here at Vermont Law School is the opportunity to reimagine how we make our environmental laws work more effectively and make them better. Um, so I thank you for spending your time thinking about this. Um, I uh, also told a story last night about the fact that uh, Professor Chevrolet and I taught a land use course here at Vermont Law School several years ago. Uh, I taught the California portion of it. It was sort of modern, recent developments in land use, and we've been looking at some very interesting infill uh, and land use related measures as part of our efforts to achieve uh, uh, minimal uh, uh, carbon emissions in, in California. And John taught the portion of the class in Vermont. We had an opportunity to take our students up to uh, the State House and meet with some Vermont state agencies. Uh, and then we went down to Logan and got on an airplane and flew over to France because the third part of the class was French land use law. We met uh, with a uh, land use professor at the Sorbonne. We met with a, uh, uh, the equivalent of a Supreme Court justice uh, in Paris. And then we took the speedy train down to Provence and met with the local land use planning agencies. It was fascinating to see that in France they were facing the same kinds of issues that we face in Vermont and we face in California, issues associated with affordable housing or workforce housing, issues associated with sprawl, issues associated with figuring out how you take the traditional local land use model uh, and expand it over time to take into account regional and statewide concerns. But we were very thrilled to be able to feature Vermont because it's really one of the two states along with Oregon that's really looked in any serious way at a form of land use planning that's more statewide, although I know from talking to many of you that's not been successful. Uh, somewhat amusingly, the administration of Vermont Law School referred to our course by a semi-French name. They called it Le Boondoggle. <laughs> uh, so that's all I want to add today. I just uh, want to welcome you here to Vermont Law School. I've greatly enjoyed being the dean. I'm about nine months in, so I will only be able to call myself a new dean for another month or two. I had a wonderful moment this morning because I was able to use, for the first time, uh, a speech that I had with Caitlin Smiling in the back, one of my former students, who was on the boondoggle, by the way, uh, uh, Caitlin Hayes, uh, which is, uh, we welcomed this morning uh, 22 uh, accelerated JD students uh, to the school. Uh, last summer, we had 10 uh, accelerated JD students. By the way, last summer, I met with them at the end of the summer and asked them how their accelerated program went because they're going to do law school in two years. They're going to work through the summers. And um, one of them said that it seemed a bit rushed. <laughs> so they were getting the message, which is great. Um, uh, but we have, uh, if, uh, we uh, entered 161 students in Vermont Law School this past fall. Uh, uh, we are thrilled. We have 180 deposits already this year for our incoming class, for the class that will start in the fall of 2018. And we usually get about 100 new applications over the course of the summer, because you can now take the LSAT uh, in the summer in June and then apply to law school and start as early as the end of August. We also have a very robust master's program and an LLN program. And our online enrollment is currently about 100 students, and we're seeing that climb as well. So um, we're very, very pleased about the robust interest in the law school and uh, the programs we have. But we do depend upon all of you in Vermont who work in nonprofit organizations, work at state agencies, work in private law firms, work with businesses uh, to help us train our students. Only 10% of our students come from Vermont, but 20% of our students end up living in Vermont. And our students took the bar in 32 different states last summer, so they also go all over the place. So welcome, we're thrilled to have you here. Please think of how Vermont Law School can help you as you go through the process, and I'll turn the podium back to David. Thank you very much. Perfect, thank you. I'll, I'll now turn the podium over to Mark Kane, who, who all of you who are planners know well, um, with decades of experience in, in the planning arena, and is the president of the Vermont Planners Association. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, my job today is to actually thank other people, so there's a lot of passing the thanks. Um, as you guys know, or many of you know, the process of putting together a conference like this is very challenging. And BPA was really excited about the prospect of working with the Commission on Act 250 to, to understand how uh, changes to Act 250 might re you know, resonate with the local planning community and take into consideration some of the many things that Vermont planners are actually understanding and dealing with on a day-to-day basis. So when the, the, the kernel of this idea for a conference came out in the, in the VPA discussions, it really resonated strongly with the executive committee. So we are really excited actually about the, both the, the ability to put this on and to actually help facilitate this conversation. And we'll talk a little bit about later about what we're hoping to do this afternoon. But probably more importantly, we're excited about bringing a really diverse group of people into this room. And I'm really surprised. I go to a lot of planning conferences, and this is probably one of the most diverse groups I've seen ever. At, an, at a VPA event, so thank you very much for coming. Um, I also want to make sure we don't forget to thank some of the people that really worked hard to put this on. And um, on behalf of VPA, I'd like to thank specifically thank Peg Elmer uh, for all the hard work that she's done. It's an amazing job. Um, her and Kate McCarthy. Kate McCarthy also was an integral part of putting this on. They've done, both done a fantastic job. Um, in addition, in addition from the VPA side of things, uh, Steve Lott's speech, who is our treasurer, um, he makes sure that this all works out from an economic perspective. And Sharon Murray, uh, who is actually on the VPA working group for Act 250, which is a, is, a, is a group that VPA has established to gather our, our membership information and communicate that back to the commission. And uh, I also like to note that Sharon is our one. Uh, Sharon and David actually are two of our new uh, FAICP members from the state of Vermont. So we're very proud of that too. <laughs> and we also should thank you know partners for putting this on. We're, we're uh, Diane Snelling. Thank you very much, Diane, for helping to go and get this organized. Uh, Donna Casey for putting this on, and obviously the folks here at the Vermont Law School, Rebecca Martina and Eli Gleason. Also, thank you very much for helping put this on. Appreciate it. So without further ado, I'm actually going to now introduce John Adams. And John Adams is the director of the Vermont Center for Geographic Information. And if any of you have met John or know John, you know he's a big fan of data and facts. And I think in this day and age, that's actually a really good thing to have as a basis for a discussion of policy. So John is going to provide us with some relevant facts and information about the state of Vermont that hopefully as we get into this afternoon's sessions, we can consider in terms of some of these strategies and approaches we might take to changing Act 250 or modifying it. So, thank you, John. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. And, and thank you for inviting me to, to speak today. Um, I asked uh, Kate McCarthy at VNRC if she could send me a list of people who would be here so I could uh, understand how nerdy I could get here. And, um, and as far as I could tell, it's a, uh, this is a pretty nerdy audience. So if uh, your idea of a good time is not a barrage of overly complicated maps and graphs as you finish eating, uh, I apologize. <laughs> so uh, going back close to 100 years ago, one of our first uh, planning reports in the state, the uh, Rural Vermont Program for the Future, uh, we had uh, two, two outcomes from this that I think, um, or I know, were, were uh, less than desirable. The first being eugenics, which we will not get into. Uh, the second uh, being this, this recommendation and this big push uh, to build highways really without much consideration about uh, associated impacts with those. Um, nearly uh, 40 years later, 1968, in uh, Vision and Choice, the document or report that would lead to Act 250, we identified some of those uh, negative externalities that came from uh, the recommendations or those actions of the previous years. And, um, and we, had this, uh, we had this map that was made, uh, and it has some beautiful maps um, in this report if you haven't seen it. Uh, this is a uh, projection of our urban areas in Vermont in 1990 uh, if, if trends were to continue. Um, and it's a, a cartographic technique we call uh, scaring people with maps. <laughs> um, 
but a big part of the report would set really what our land use goals are uh, up until today, and that's uh, really looking at our, our traditional, um, our working landscape surrounded by uh, compact settlements. Um, and, and this report, again, really set the way for, for Act 250 and trying to, to preserve Vermont's landscape. Uh, this is our urban areas today. I tried to mimic some of the, the colors of this 1968 uh, map. Uh, thankfully, uh, we did not see the urban expansion or urban growth as was uh, projected. Um, I don't think it was ever possible for that to happen, but I think in, in we have to acknowledge that uh, things would likely be a lot worse if it wasn't for Act 250. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of our development patterns, maybe why some of them are happening, some of the opportunities, challenges we have here in Vermont. Before I do that, I'll just touch upon a few, or ask the question, you know, should our land use policy promote this traditional rural scene and, and concentrated settlements that we highlighted in, in that, uh, 1968? And I'll try to talk about maybe elements of that that we weren't thinking of then or emphasizing and, and still don't today. Um, starting with this bar graph, which I realize is not, doesn't look like the most uh, exciting uh, bar graph, it is a bar graph. I tried to make the bars look like roads as if that would make it more interesting to you, like you're a bunch of five-year-olds or something. Um, but it is uh, an, important, um, an important point here. And, uh, it, you can't read the bottom, but what this shows is uh, median household annual vehicle miles traveled by different areas in Vermont. And to the left, the far left, we have the exurbs of Chittenden County. Uh, next to that, we have the state median, so about 22,000 uh, vehicle miles traveled per household. And then to the right of that, we have uh, a half mile from our downtowns, our designated downtowns, and our neighborhood development areas. Uh, which we're seeing households traveling with, with vehicle miles traveled of up to two-thirds, one-third to two-thirds less than uh, the median in Vermont. And this is really significant. And we're able to measure this thanks to um, the Agency of Transportation and the Transportation Research Center at Vermont working with the Household Travel Survey to oversample for Vermont so we could really get location-specific data and not just census data that's out there. Uh, what are some of the benefits of that? When you think about affordability, uh, annual cost to operate a vehicle in the United States is close to $9,000. And Vermont households, as we know, spend a really large percentage of their income uh, on transportation and vehicle ownership. And we often look at the medians, uh, but when you think about uh, giving someone the opportunity to live in a place without uh, a vehicle or without owning a vehicle, uh, it's really empowering. This is really key, I think, to building inclusive communities and having more people come to Vermont. So walkability, I think, a great indicator of what, what types of communities we want to build. You look at energy. Um, this is from uh, VEIC. Over half of a, a household's uh, energy costs are associated with transportation. So living in, in our walkable neighborhoods or within a half mile of downtowns, you see a 31 to, uh, or 16 to 31 reduction in energy costs uh, for Vermont households. Health, um, can anyone tell me who this uh, individual is? Surgeon General, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, uh, under President uh, Obama. Does anyone know what he's talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe before, uh, before he started talking about uh, how we have the first generation of children in this country that are expected to live shorter lives than their parents. Um, and that's because of things like uh, diabetes, ca cardiovascular disease, and other diseases really related to inactivity. And he started a big campaign calling on planners, on uh, transportation engineers, on community leaders to really focus on building uh, walkable neighborhoods because we know uh, there's a, a far less prevalence of these issues in uh, neighborhoods that are walkable. Uh, and this statistic is showing that over the past 25 years, we have seen a 50% increase in obesity in high school students in Vermont. 
water quality. So uh, a lot of talk about impervious surface and, and water quality in Vermont. When we look at uh, the amount of impervious surface inside of our centers versus outside in population and jobs, uh, one acre of impervious surface inside some of our centers uh, has about 12 people and 10.6 jobs compared to uh, five people and 2.2 jobs outside of centers. So you need about two and a half times as much impervious for the same amount of people in, uh, outside of our centers and close to uh, five times as many uh, as much for jobs. Um, so that's, I mean, that's just a, a sampling of, I think, some of the benefits of a settlement pattern like this, looking at issues ranging from health, uh, affordability, energy, water quality. Um, now I'll shift over to, to ask, you know, where is development happening in Vermont? And this is an update to, to some numbers for a talk I gave a couple of years ago at a, a VPA event. So looking at uh, E911 points, when we look at new residential structures from 2008 to, to 2018, or to the end of 2017, um, this is showing the areas in, in dark green. Those are both outside of uh, centers and in black uh, inside centers. Um, we see not a tremendous amount of variation from year to year in where development is happening. However, um, and most of it is happening on the outside. However, this, uh, because of the way 911 has been uh, keeping their data, for multifamily units, they're only registering as one structure. So we're not actually getting a whole lot of information here. When we drill down uh, and look at some county differences, there are some significant, uh, significant differences. And to the far left, you see uh, Chittenden County, uh, where you have a much higher percentage of um, residential development happening inside centers, and we'll revisit why that might be happening later. Um, when you look at new multifamily structures, the difference is, is uh, fairly dramatic here. Almost all multifamily uh, development is happening within uh, Chittenden County. And luckily, um, uh, CCRPC has been keeping data on units per structure as well as year built. So we can go back, what this chart is showing us, going back to 1890 all the way to today. And the areas in uh, green are development outside of centers, so actual units including multifamily. So you can see as we start to, to build out the highway, the expansion uh, out of centers, uh, you see that dip in the late 70s. Um, and then when you look at between 1990 to 2006, you see about uh, only 40% of our residential um, buildings were inside centers. And then uh, post uh, crash in 2007, there's been a big drop there, uh, or a big increase in development in centers where we see 60% uh, happening on the inside. You look at uh, commercial structures, and, uh, and it's worth noting that um, the, the uh, number on the, the far left, again, that's Chittenden County, um, that is only showing a little over 200 over 10 years. So we haven't seen a whole lot of new uh, commercial construction uh, over the past decade, at least compared to, to residential buildings as measured by this, this metric here. Uh, but a lot of, more of it is happening in centers than outside compared to our residential um, construction. And looking at Act 250 decisions, I thought it would be interesting to try to compare them, but uh, because of, for a number of, of different reasons, one of how the data is, is uh, kept and managed, and two, I just didn't have very much time to dig into it, um, there really wasn't a way to make any sort of apples to apples comparison. I'm actually not sure there's a whole lot of useful information to be gleaned here. What this showing is uh, minor and major applications, so it excludes administrative amendments um, by jurisdictional type. So you can see uh, a lot more in terms of uh, commercial applications being reviewed by Act 250 as compared to uh, residential act, uh, applications, and this is showing from 1970. Um, to, uh, to present day. So 
So I think many of you have seen um, these maps before, the dot density maps of population looking at uh, 1850 to 1930. And I think the story here is that we're moving from an agricultural um, society to an industrial one. You could see this is approximately or, or similar sized population and you can see um, on the map to the right a concentration of our population, right? You see it, it gets a little uh, lighter shade on the outside. So as, as our transportation uh, infrastructure and, and we get rail improves and we industrialize, you can see people coming in from our, our hill farms and coming into our centers. So I tried to recreate a dot density map of what, um, what Vermont looks like today. Uh, you can see a little more dispersion, um, a lot of growth in some of these centers and an expansion into the, um, the suburbs of, of Burlington. But this is, um, this is using some of our, our residential uh, data of where people live. When you look at daytime populations, I think it's a, it's a very different story. And in 1850 to 1930, our daytime and nighttime populations were pretty similar. Whereas now it's very different and you can see a, a much bigger concentration of our jobs uh, in our centers throughout Vermont. Uh, and if you extrude those, those jobs into sort of a more modern 3D map as opposed to uh, 1930s dot density map, you can see here the extent of it, how it is concentrating in the, those uh, downtowns across Vermont. Uh, and this is a, a sheep density map. Um, and it shouldn't, shouldn't, be, shouldn't be in here. Uh, <laughs> So um, what, what is driving these development trends? And maybe we'll start like, by backing up and looking maybe uh, countrywide or at a, uh, even globally, uh, what's been happening. So here, here's economic activity in uh, the United States split in half. Um, you can see that um, you know, despite these uh, uh, transportation costs decreasing dramatically, and uh, the invention of the internet, um, that we've, we've had an increase in concentration of economic activity and productivity in our big cities uh, and urban areas. Um, and it hasn't been equal in all urban areas. There's been a lot of work done by uh, Ed Glazer at um, Harvard University, as well as uh, Benjamin Chinitz before him and, and um, Carnegie Mellon showing that uh, it's a combination of uh, population centers as well as uh, educated people and uh, entrepreneurial people as measured by a percentage of people in small businesses. So if you compare Detroit versus New York, for example, where you had a lot of small business owners in the textile industry um, as opposed to large uh, companies, vertically integrated companies like the auto manufacturers, um, you the small business folks were able to adapt to a changing economy. And those are the, the areas where we've seen the, the largest amount of growth. Um, and it's telling when you think about the company that's basically made, uh, they've almost made you know, place irrelevant in terms of the technology that they've um, enabled people to communicate with. Uh, instead of buying, you, you'd think that maybe you'd buy the, some less some cheap land somewhere. If you've got uh, great uh, internet access, Google went uh, and, and bought uh, some of the most expensive real estate in the country, right, in New York City, uh, spending a decade ago close to $2 billion for the Port Authority building, and then just a couple months ago buying another building for $2.4 uh, billion. Um, so what does, that, what does that mean or what does that look like in terms of settlement patterns uh, across the country and in Vermont? Well, um, and, and across the world, really, we've seen an urbanization happening, right? So people coming into these centers and depending on uh, housing supply, housing prices, uh, transportation costs, people will move out further and further um, into the, the countryside and commute into uh, into their jobs in the, into the cities. And this, this is work done by uh, Alistair Ray and Garrett uh, Dash Nelson at Dartmouth, who um, looked at our origin and destination of com commuting patterns uh, across the country here. Um, 
transportation cost, I think driving a big, big portion of it. Here in Vermont, uh, we've done a lot to make transportation really as inexpensive as possible. Um, more than 47 other states, um, our share of, of state and local spending covered by user fees in terms of driving it is covered by drivers. So 75% of that is coming from a different uh, revenue source. So there's no link between uh, how much you drive and really what you're paying for that infrastructure. So um, thankfully, uh, Garrett uh, Dash Nelson has shared the data he used for, for this study. And I pulled out uh, the Vermont commuting patterns. And you can see here um, the origin and destinations of where people are working. And he, um, they ran various al algorithms to determine sort of what is the economic geography in terms of the connectedness of these communities. And he found sort of four, uh, four separate different operational sort of economic zones happening in Vermont. <coughs> you can kind of see illustrated here. So um, in th this really corresponds sort of to a lot of other data that we see in terms of loss and um, population loss in rural counties, where you can see the areas outside of that, that Burlington uh, metro area or commuter shed uh, starting to lose population. Um, here you can see for the first time uh, in the past few years, a number of different counties in Vermont are experiencing a, a natural decrease in population, so um, deaths are, we're seeing more deaths than we're seeing births, which isn't, shouldn't come as a terrible surprise that we've, uh, we've known about our aging population for a while. Here's a, our projected population pyramid for uh, 2030 in Vermont. And here's how this, uh, here's how this looks in terms of a thematic map. Um, and I don't, I'm not trying to scare people with maps here either. Uh, I should point out this isn't a dramatic drop in population, um, nor is it a dramatic increase in population. These colors sometimes can make it seem like it's a, a greater difference than it is. But I do think I'll, I'll draw our attention to maybe some of those centers, like um, you even have like Montpelier, Barry, uh, Virgins, St. Albans, uh, Newport. Uh, Rutland, Bennington, all those areas in the darker red um, shade of the spectrum, which I think is something that, that we, should, we should focus on and see if it's something that we can, can change. So looking at opportunities, um, what are some of the opportunities in Vermont? Well, Vermont has some pretty smart people. Uh, by almost, I think, any metric, this map, I think, is showing us um, you know, percentage of population with um, university degrees, um, and we have a, an opportunity to use uh, a lot of data and make uh, some changes in what we have control over. And I have a few slides that I've adopted from Joe Minicozzi for Vermont. Uh, how many people here know who Joe Minicozzi is or have seen him speak? He spoke at the downtown conference. Uh, awesome. So a good number of people, if you haven't, I highly recommend checking out some of his work. I think if you Google Joe and um, either downtown conference or uh, he spoke at the uh, Let's Talk Progress event last year in Burlington, you can see uh, this talk in its entirety. But so Joe is a big advocate of using data and information in terms of, of um, municipal governance and governments in general particularly as it relates to their uh, understanding their, their tax base and where some of their revenues and expenditures are coming from. And he draws this example with farmers who increasingly are using some very sophisticated data and information using drones to understand what is the yield, the crop yield, uh, for what amount of uh, input that they are putting into their field. So a farmer will grow sort of the most profitable crop based on what it takes for them to um, put into their, their field. And if we think of our, our cities uh, like this, um, and we decide you know, what kind of crops do we want to grow in our cities, uh, it helps us, I think, think a little bit differently about some of the decisions we make. So if we compare uh, a mixed use, this is a mixed use building in Montpelier. 
Uh, it's uh, on a close to a tenth of an acre, 16 apartments, um, with uh, my house on, on close to a tenth of an acre, uh, and uh, a big box store. You can see uh, big differences in tax value here. Um, and this is maybe traditionally how we look at uh, revenue from some of these buildings. But we are breaking it down by area, right? We have a finite amount of space. Uh, we can't just create, we can't annex, you know, part of New Hampshire if we, we want more space. Um, or we could try, but I think it wouldn't go over very really well. Uh, we might have better luck with Quebec. Um, when we break it down by acre, it tells a much different story. Uh, so that mixed-use building is now, uh, we're yielding $150,000 uh, per acre. Uh, as opposed to 4,300 per acre for a big box store, uh, and you look at the amount of infrastructure that it uses, we're using far less for that mixed-use development. So we're seeing a much bigger yield with far less uh, expenditure in terms of public infrastructure for that development. Um, when you extrude that in terms of uh, three dimensions using 3D mapping, it, you can sort of see that picture very clearly and. Uh, we posted, um, Jenny Bauer in our office actually posted this at, at midnight last night. Um, if you go to our Twitter account at VCGI, I posted a link to an interactive map and we just uh, uploaded about 50 towns in Vermont where you can explore the property value per acre in, in three dimensions. This is uh, St. Albans. You can see the downtown core very clearly there. And I want to be clear, these aren't like big, tall buildings. This is, uh, this is value per acre of our downtown, our traditional downtown streets. Um, those treasured assets, those, those nicest buildings that we have in our downtowns are yielding the highest value per acre. Uh, this is the Walmart in St. Albans that I've circled in blue there. And I want to be clear, I'm not um, picking um, I don't want to pick on Walmart, or I'm not saying like that they're a bad company or organization. I think, uh, and the way Joe talks about it is they're doing exactly what we've asked them to do and what we've set them up to do, right? Um, he tells a story of how one of the vice presidents at, at Walmart went and talked to the uh, North American sort of assessing conference and explained to them uh, everything that went into their buildings and how they you know, bulk purchase contractors and, and really how cheap it was to build these buildings and that they had a lifespan of 15 years and that they were basically worthless to anybody else, right? Just sort of bragging about how, how um, terrible these buildings are, which is a really smart thing to do, right? If you can lower your t property tax bill across, you know, 1,500 municipalities or however many they have stores in, and this is the system that, that we built. This is what we're saying. Like the worse, the worse your building is, the less we'll charge you, despite, regardless of how much infrastructure you're using. Meanwhile, if, if you, you want to invest in some of our downtowns, the nicer building you, you build, um, you know, the, the bigger your tax bill is going to be. So it's not that, um, when you think about it, you know, we're getting exactly what we, we've designed for, a combination of in terms of our economics and our regulatory structure. A uh, few other towns in Vermont, I don't know if we want to play like the, the guessing, uh, guessing game here. Anyone know, know where this is? Nope. Mm -mm. Southern part of the state? Bennington. Waterbury. No, nope. smaller place. No. Nope. Oh, come on, guys. You got this. <laughs> it's right next to Waterbury. It's Richmond. <laughs> I can't believe you didn't get that. <laughs> Um, this one should be easy. Virgins. 
This one. This one is too hard. You're not going to get it. <laughs> it's Reedsboro. <laughs> So you can see that this applies at different scales, right? These traditional centers are really providing the highest amount of, of yield per acre for, um, for what they are. Now, there are a number of things aside from the economics I think that we, we should consider here. When we looked at Montpelier uh, and looking at the uh, assessed property value per acre, uh, compared to percentage of non-conforming properties, there was a very clear relationship, right? The higher value a property was, the more likely it was to be uh, non-conforming. So most of our downtown, uh, if it were to burn down, could not be rebuilt according to our zoning code, or at least our old zoning code. I'm hopeful that our new one can um, support that kind of uh, development. Um, uh, property values sort of before and after zoning uh, per road mile. You can see here after we enacted zoning, we were building um, at a value of one third of what we were before zoning. So you can imagine, you know, with our uh, requiring greater setbacks, road frontage, et cetera, we're using a lot more uh, infrastructure, taking up more space uh, than we used to for our, our uh, traditional development patterns. And a lot of people uh, want to live in these areas. So there's a high demand. This is a, um, this was a, a survey done by RSG, uh, and 91 of respondents in Vermont said they would walk to um, school shopping or other activities if they lived close enough. And people want to live in small towns, right? So luckily, we're not. Um, we're not all sort of profit-seeking robots who would just move to, uh, to big cities like New York City, right? Uh, we are willing to forego the maximum economic productivity to live in a place that, that we like. And a lot of people want to live in small towns. Um, and, then, and then we have a lot of just basic things, I think, going for us in Vermont. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about millennials in particular as, you know, wanting, needing to live in cities, et cetera, but they're not any different than uh, anybody in the sort of history of who we've been asking uh, as long as we have. What, what is the number one priority for where you want to live? Well, people want to be safe. Uh, people want good schools. Um, people want uh, job opportunities. And we have those here in Vermont. And we also have really good beer. <laughs> So we have a lot of the ingredients, I think, of, of what people want. And I see these all as, as big opportunities of things that we uh, have some control over um, in terms of who's going to, how we want our, our communities to look like. What are some game changers that are just going to maybe blow up everything that we know about um, the world? One was uh, mentioned earlier, self-driving cars and, and shared mobility. Um, I think we'll, we'll see a lot of development of these things um, outside of Vermont before they come here. But there, I think it's hard to tell exactly how this would, would play out. Is it just going to be less expensive to live further out and you can just you know, get in your car and start doing your work and for your two hour commute to wherever? Um, or is it going to be such that um, we have a huge opportunity in, in shared mobility and people not uh, needing to own cars and freeing up a lot of uh, these urban reserves that we have in our, our downtowns and our um, villages. So this is Montpelier, the areas in black is over 100 acres of parking, right? I mean, you don't need that parking space if you don't have a vehicle that needs to sit idle for 95% of the time. That opens up a lot of opportunity in our downtowns and villages. Um, then we have the Hyperloop, um, not on everyone's radar, but definitely on the radar of megalomaniac billionaires um, <laughs> who are competing to see who will build the first uh, Hyperloop. Uh, this is, I think, is uh, Richard Branson's company. Um, you can go on their website and punch in, um, you know, two cities and it'll tell you how long it'll take for this uh, pneumatic tube frictionless pneumatic tube to fire you over to the other city. Uh, this is Boston to New York, and that's 26 uh, minutes. 
So if we think about um, we think about what the highway did in Vermont and how that led to Active 50 and a lot of uh, population growth and, and what this might do, this is like with some traffic, like a four hour trip down to 26 minutes, uh, that could really radically change um, our landscape and where people live. If you can commute you know, hundreds of miles within uh, a half hour, you know, that gives, it just changes our world. Um, and then of course, climate change. Uh, you know, the biggest issue we're facing right now. This is this is just showing you know by 2100, our uh, the Montpelier temperature for summers will be uh, 88 degrees, which is the equivalent of summers in in North Miami. And um, there's a lot for us to think about in terms of we heard a little bit about insects and uh, in terms of extreme weather events and what does that mean for our tourism industry, etc. But uh, really, the big big issue for me or that I uh, keep thinking about is, is sea level rise. And I don't know how many people took this quiz in the New York Times a, a few weeks ago. So it's asking you, you know, what, what state is this uh, given X amount of, of sea level rise? And I can't remember what the, the amount was. And um, it's just sort of mind blowing uh, to think about. And, and I'm going to end sort of on this uh, this slide here, and not because I want it to be that you know depressing or anything, but for me, when I look at it, it helps put what I'm trying to tackle into perspective. Uh, it it seems a lot easier to deal with things like oh, we can oh, you know fix what's wrong with Act 250 when you think about uh, <laughs> uh, trying to relocate you know millions of, of people or, or sea level rise. And my final thoughts, I mean, I think I just want to echo the reoccurring theme that we've had uh, today and, and that David started, started with is, is we need to find that, that shared vision. And I think we've got a lot already there with our, our land use goals of our, our compact settlements surrounded by working landscape. We know it can help us address issues ranging from health to energy to uh, you know, con wildlife habitat conservation to um, to clean water and really zeroing in on that and focusing not on identifying what we don't want, but identifying what we do want and then making sure that we have the conditions in place for that to happen. And that's gonna go beyond just uh, adjusting our regulatory system, but uh, we need to look at things like our tax system and, um, and a lot of like maybe weird ideas like we heard from Marilyn, right? And, and a key point, I think, to, as we do that, uh, an important thing is really the relationships that we have with people and, and building a lot of those relationships and coming together in events like this and talking about those ideas, uh, even if they're different than the ones we have. I think we really need to engage with each other and um, those relationships will help us be far more resilient when we do have things that are much bigger in terms of their impact on change, like. Uh, what we saw with sea level rise there. Thank you. I think we might have a, a couple minutes for questions. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, speak up, I don't think we've got a mic. Back in 1969, uh, 70, one of Governor Davis's biggest advisor was a guy named Ian McCarr, who was the father of Earth Day and GIS. GIS. Uh, from one of the interviews I've done with people of that era, one of the reasons the statewide land use plan uh, did not emerge from committee was you know, the statewide zoning fear, but also because we didn't have the capability to map you know, biotic and abiotic resources and study ecosystems in such a way to make decisions. We've come a lot farther since then. There was an attempt in uh, Deer, um, Dover and Wilmington to do a, a bit of that, and, and they did have a plan, but so how much more robust is the capability of Vermont to do this kind of studying and mapping of, of, of resources, of, of ecosystems, because 
This is all about ecosystems. The environment's a big thing. Ecosystems in an area are pretty important. So how much more sophisticated and accessible is that today? Thank you. Um, that's a terrific question. And Mark, if you need to like yank me off the stage if I go for too long here, and we know. Um, we have such a tremendous wealth of information that is that is literally coming online like right now like like last night we're, we're working towards statewide uh, parcel data which will have complete which, which unlike out west where we had those straight lines the PLSS we don't have that luxury here it's a lot harder to, to map property boundaries in, in Vermont We've just completed in the fall what's called statewide LIDAR. So how many people are familiar with uh, LIDAR technology? It's amazing. Um, almost everyone in this room, uh, for the three that aren't uh, familiar with it, um, it's essentially, um, if you think of a bat and echolocation, we have planes that fly with LIDARs and they'll send a pulse a laser down and get, get a, a very accurate uh, location on the Earth and X, Y, and Z, Z, Z. I just outed myself as a Canadian um, <laughs> coordinate, um, and we get multiple returns: one, uh, the top of trees, to the, the bottom of the Earth, and then we can run various algorithms to sort of strip all the buildings and trees off to understand our terrain as well as our surface modeling. Uh, and we are one of a handful of states that will now have statewide coverage. Uh, of this data, one of the first things we're doing with it now is generating uh, extremely high resolution land cover data. Uh, right now we have, uh, we used to have 30 meter resolution and we, a few years ago about 10 meter. We'll be going down to half meter resolution, which is close to 2,000 times more uh, accurate. Um, and I think we will be the first state that has that uh, data and information. I'm really excited about it. Uh, on top of that, we'll be extruding impervious surface and building footprints with height attributes, uh, tree canopy with height attributes, uh, and it allows us to do a lot of uh, much more accurate hydrologic mod modeling um, in terms of floodplains and a number of other, under understanding our rivers a lot better. So those are, you know, just a handful of, of the things, not to mention how much easier the technology is um, to work with. and. Um, and how many more people know how to use it. So 25 years ago, uh, we had a user base of 128 uh, entities, and we had someone who, our entire database fit on, on 12 floppy disks, and someone, people would fill out mail orders and send them in, and uh, usually now is when someone says, like, I did that, um, and, and sent in the mail. But, uh, so, um, and now, as of just last year, we had uh, 77,000 unique uh, users go to our geodata portal. Uh, we have over 1,000 data sets in it. And um, to think of that difference, like 77,000 compared to uh, 128 in 25 years is, is massive. Um, and there are also... Um, this shift to using things as services as opposed to um, we used to send data, right? People used to download data. Now they stream data like you stream Netflix because these things are changing so quickly. So you want to be able to get data directly from the source. So we've worked with the agencies to federate access to these authoritative data sources so that you could just stream them as things change. You don't need to you know, go try to get the new whatever data set you are actually looking at, whatever the freshest data is. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> John is at the, at the executive director of the BCGI. So if you want to get any information on BCGI, you can contact you at? You can contact me at uh, john.e.adams at vermont.gov um, or uh, any of other means, you can just come talk to me. Uh, I'll, I'll be here in the afternoon. Um, yeah, people don't, don't talk to each other enough, especially not in my profession anymore. <laughs> Thank you, John. So now that John has given us lots to think about, um, I think it's turned to, time to turn the proceedings over to Rebecca Stone 
Rebecca's been working with VPA uh, and the rest of the committee on, on this conference to facilitate or design a facilitation around, uh, around the afternoon breakout sessions. And I'll let Rebecca give us the lowdown on that. And um, I think just from a logistics perspective, um, there is a, a sign out sheet, there's a list outside that tells you where to go. If you're interested in a session, I think Rebecca will cover both of that too. Thank you. Great, thanks Mark, and thanks to everybody. Um, you've just taken in a ton of information and data and opinions, and we're really excited now to flip that around, turn it over to you. It's time for BPA and folks in the room to hear what you all think about Act 250. What's great, what's working, what could be improved, what will make this act really fulfill its promise and do great things? So I have a few announcements. I'm going to introduce what we are about to do for the next hour and a half and how it's going to happen. Uh, we actually have a jam-packed hour and a half. So we'll try to give you some pretty good instructions. I do have a fun announcement in addition to the work announcement. So which one do you guys want first? Fun or work? Fun, okay, good choice. Um, so after this all wraps up, if you are not jetting out of town, VPA is generously buying appetizers for folks for a little planner's therapy over at Worthy Burger. So if you need to process and get some things out, um, come on over. It is a cash bar, but we invite you to join us on the patio. Do you want to get a really quick sense of how many people might join? It's not a firm commitment, but I want to tell them how much to make. So raise your hand if you think you might come over and join us. Okay, all right, you can still change your mind. Um, so after the conference, if you do wanna do that, pack up, you can swing by the South Royalton Farmer's Market on the green on your way, that'll be rocking, and come over, we'll have appetizers round four at Worthy Burger. All right, so now the work that has to happen first. Um, as I said, the purpose of the next breakout sessions are really to get your input on what you've heard today and give some structured recommendations that can inform the work of the commission. So I think we heard this morning that there will be a report and summary coming out of this conference. Everything you were about to tell us in the breakout sessions will be captured in that report. As we've also heard, this is an incredibly diverse group in the room today. That is wonderful, and it also means we are not looking for you all to agree on anything. So when you get into your breakout sessions, we want to make sure it's a really open, honest, free-flowing conversation, that you feel free to speak your mind, and that there is not pressure to come up with a group consensus on what is said. We will capture all the different opinions and want to know how you all think. We won't be recording because we want to make sure it's a really open and honest conversation and everyone feels free to really share opinions. So what you're about to do is to pick one of 10 topics that are in your packets. If you did check out the posters that were in the back of the room, it's the same 10 there. They all have a room assigned, so you can look in your packet. Um, we are going to do two rounds of conversation. How many of you have ever done a World Cafe? A lot of people. Um, so this is similar in that we're gonna have one conversation to start that's really about doing an assessment and a temperature check on Act 250 related to a particular topic. And then a second session that builds on that first conversation. We're not staying in this room, there are no paper to scribble on on the table, so not quite a world cafe. But we do wanna make sure we can really get through that assessment part in the first round, mostly save the recommendations, and then we'll come back to that after a short break. You are free to stick with the same topic for both rounds of conversation, or you can switch if you wanna check out something else. You may find that your first conversation gives you great ideas about a different topic and you want to bring those ideas and make sure that topic has the benefit of what you've heard. Um, we are going to take about a five minute break.